Hello and welcome to Shoot the Breeze, where we take a nostalgic look at a random football magazine from the past. I'm Andy Smith, aka Scott's Footy Cards on Twitter, and with me is Tom Brogan. Hello. In each episode, we'll invite a special guest to join us in trawling through the magazine and discuss anything contained within it. This could be anything from an article, to a photograph, to a competition, to an advert. Basically, if it's in it, then we'll talk about it. So sit back and let's shoot the breeze. Wriggles clear. Might just get the chip and he does, he scores! Oh, what a great back And this week's guest is the winner of the 1991 Daily Record Golden Shot Award, Claybank Hall of Famer, Ken Eady. Thanks for coming on, Ken. Welcome. Thank you. Privilege. A- absolute, absolute pleasure and a privilege and an honour and all those sort of words to have you on, Ken. It's, um, it's a dream come true for for a uh, for Clyde Bank supporters like myself and Tom, so thank you for taking the time. You yeah, are very welcome. So, so before we, we jump into the magazine, let's let's just talk about um a bit about what's happening with you at the minute. You're you're in the states. You've moved over there. We're in. Uh, we moved to Florida uh, just over two years ago. We had to sort of move in a you know very very quick uh, decision because we were. We'd actually waited about 15 years in a visa to get in here. My wife, uh, lucky enough, got her sister lives over here. And her mum and dad live here. Actually, right next door to us now because we've moved house next door. Yeah, okay. You must think I'm mad. But <laughs> <laughs> it's good with the kids. Our grandparents are right next door. Um, so, yeah, we waited about 15 years. And then just over two years ago in, in November, um, we got word that the visa had came through. Mm-hmm. And we only had six months to act or you go back to the bottom of the list. Yeah. So we just sold up everything and, and moved. So and that's what's here now. I mean, it was it was a strange time to be moving to America and, you know, everything that was going on um, with yeah. Donald Trump and the likes of that. So I'm... I'm... Well, yeah, I think uh, the visa took so long because all the, all the carry on with the, you know, all the troubles in the world and all that and mm-hmm. America stopped a lot of people coming in but um, the last the last year has been pretty pretty horrendous for us yeah. um, obviously the COVID thing's not helped um, my wife's had a, a terrible year she had a severe illness and um, but she's getting over it now um, I also had a bit of a traumatic time in September I didn't know I just uh, was complaining about a sore leg um, for a while, and um, Sarah said, "Oh, you need to go to the doctor." I said, oh, "You know, I thought it was just an old injury, old football one flaring up. I had a pain behind my knee, right. and then it sort of crept up to the back of my thigh, and then I basically got a, I had a Zoom call because you weren't allowed to go to the doctors here because of COVID. I had to do a Zoom call with a doctor, and she actually said, "Oh, you need to go and see a vascular surgeon." So. Uh, I went to see one, and he said, I want you to go to ER first thing in the morning at 6 a.m. Oh. <laughs> and then I was told after my op- I had an emergency operation, and I was told that uh, I was lucky I got done there, I would have been dead. I had a, a massive blood clot from my navel all the way to my ankle. Wow. Uh, don't know how it happened, haven't a clue, because I'm still as fit as ever don't know mm. but they had to sort of make a few incisions in my leg one you know one of my groin one in back of my knee one of my ankle and they used a I don't know what the technique was it's like blasting it out yeah. and uh managed to clear most of it um so yeah it was a bit a bit scary mm. um but yeah I'm okay now Hello. so kids are well the oldest one's still off he's doing virtual schooling Got the wee one back to nursery recently, so yeah, everything's a little bit better now. Uh, well, both had were COVID jags, both of them, so 
I'm glad. Um, I'm glad to see you're still calling them Jags because after after, yeah, Jags, after yeah. 22 years down in England, I'm afraid I, I've started calling them Jabs. So I apologise to, yeah, to Scotland. Yeah. So yeah, hopefully onwards and upwards. I yeah. hear user off a lockdown now. Yeah, well, some of it. Some of it's been, um, you know, taken taken off. So. Uh, yeah, we're hoping to get back for a holiday, maybe in September, to mm. see everyone. So, yeah, onwards and upwards. Brilliant. Now, listen, I'm glad to, to hear that you're on the mend and and the, the, the wife's on the mend as well. That's that's great news on yeah, that. Yeah, so, thanks. I'm, I'm guessing, you know, if, if there's a place you want to recover from anything, it's probably in the beside the pool in the hot weather. Is that... Well, it's not the only reason, but one of the reasons I moved here because I just hated the weather. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Or, or Britain, for that matter. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't think I've had a pair of long trousers on here since in the last two and a bit years, <laughs> which is pretty good. The climate's pretty good all year round. Yeah. You know, I'm sitting outside now, and it's probably about 70 odd degrees. <laughs> so yeah. it's, it's not bad. It's not bad. Okay, so the the magazine, we're, we're here to look through the, the Shoot magazine, and the one we've picked uh -huh. is from the 11th of November, 1978. So again, before we, we delve in, so you would have been about 17 at this point, 78, was that right? 78, uh, I just, why, I would have been seven, 17, yes, yeah, so yeah. born in 61, yeah. So so what's your memories of magazines? Did you get Shoot or Match or Roy the Rovers or anything the, like that? I had the Shoot, I had the Shoot every week, yeah, we used to get it, um, read through it and obviously wanted to be one of these guys mm. that were in it yeah. on the front on the front cover so uh yeah no i always i always got got the shoot every week yeah or was it month no it was weekly it was wasn't weekly it? yeah yeah uh, it was weekly yeah i got it every week so when you, you you actually have appeared in it quite a few times in terms of photographs and articles and stuff like that obviously a bit later on like say around about 90 and stuff with the, with the yeah. scottish cup yeah. so so you you, you did fulfill your dreaming in that really and that's that's quite something yeah. else isn't it yeah oh it was a great magazine fantastic yeah, yeah. so so the one we've, we've picked out is uh as i say 11th november 1978 we'll look as we do front cover and this one has gary Owen of man city and he's doing a bit of a joe jordan to me yeah. as he goes yeah. up for a head and by that i mean his hands raised high and mm -hmm. he's gone up with martin peters of norwich city uh, there's a couple of great kits on display. Man City with the Umbro Diamonds, all blue, mm -hmm. and Norwich City with the yellow and green Admiral kit. Uh, it's 18 pence, and there is wow. a feature in colour, Southampton Team Group plus Club Spotlight. We'll have a look at that when we go inside. Mm -hmm. And there's a focus in colour on Tony Curry of Leeds United. So, again, it's it's quite it's quite telling that the, the focus in excuse the, the the phrase, but they're focusing on things being in colour in the magazine. And, you know, I, I don't remember at this point there being a lot of black and white, but, you know, the fact that they're, they're actually making a big deal out, this is in colour, this is in colour, I guess just sort of says a bit about the time. Um, but they yeah. also preview the Football League Cup round four and the Scottish League Cup quarterfinals. So do we want to say anything about the front cover? No, I don't, don't think so. Doesn't, doesn't, doesn't... Um, Capture you, does it not? The, the the referee with the comb over in the background, anything like that? <laughs> some badge the referee's got on as well. I mean, that that that's probably like a quarter of his his, his top is that badge. Yeah, yeah. What it what it stands out for me is the the Norwich strip. That's the Admiral stuff, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, re I remember I used to follow um, my favourite English club at the time were Leeds United, and mm. I'm pretty sure they was it Admiral Ray had, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it'd be pretty much similar to that, except it'd be white and blue, yeah. I guess, wouldn't it? The the colours, um, be all white, white shorts, but the, the the piping and stuff would be blue. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yellow, yellow piping. I think they had or something. Yeah, I know. Um, yeah, I think they might actually. Well, the Tony Curry one, um, the, the focus on has him in the Leeds United kit. So we'll we'll take a good look at that later on. So we'll dive in into page two and. There's a, so across these two pages, pages two and three, it's a news desk. So these are little snippets of stories and information and stuff. And I'm just going to pick out a couple. And if there's anything you want to um, pick out, let me know as well. So the first one I'm going to look at is about Terry Geno. 
So it says the transfer bargain of this season must be Southampton's £15,000 goalkeeper from Halifax Town, Terry Geno. And in only his fourth team appearance for the first team, he made a string of tremendous saves to foil Everton at Goodison. Watch out for the name. Now, as a wee spoiler, he, did, he played 36 league games for Southampton, but he'll be better remembered at Blackburn Rovers, where he spent 10 years between 81 and 91, and he made 289 league appearances, which is still a club record for a Blackburn keeper. Now, Brad Friedo left the club two games short of this total. That's that's a that's a gutting one, isn't it, to get that well, far, that close yeah. to there. Uh, Terry Geno wasn't really a name that I recall, but he's obviously a stalwart at Blackburn Rovers. I'm sure he's remembered fondly there. Is it some anybody recognising? I remember him? the name. I remember the name. Yeah, I don't think he's as many appearances as Big Gal, though, is he? Oh no, no. <laughs> that's, that's he's into the thousands, surely. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so the next one I'm going to pick out is fantastic, and this is the question. They ask a question: Could a player play for both sides in the same match? So, shoot, say, it actually happened. In a third division match in 1932, Jimmy Oakes was one of the Port Vale backs against Charlton Athletic. And shortly after half time, the match was abandoned due to fog and was replayed later in the season. By that time, Jimmy Oakes had been transferred to Charlton and played against his old club. I've never heard anything like that at all. That's probably, that's got to be unique, that. And I can't imagine yeah. there'd be any, many cases of that. But yeah, as they say, fantastic. The next one, um, all seated. So this is about Greenock Morton. It says, Greenock Morton may follow Aberdeen's example and make their ground all seated and covered. The present capacity at Capital Law is 18,000. Aberdeen are all seated and plans are in hand to make Pataudry fully covered. So Tom, go on, tell me. I, I can never get my head around the differences between Aberdeen and Kilbowie in terms of who was first for what. Yeah, unfortunately, I think it's Aberdeen. This comes up a lot where people say it's Clay Bank, some people say Clay Bank, some people say Aberdeen. And I think it is Aberdeen. I think Clay Bank set out to make it all seated before Aberdeen were all seated. And I think Aberdeen put benches in to the beach end or something, and that made them all seated. And I think Kilbowie wasn't finished until January 1980 as an all, as an all seated ground. So I, I, I think it's Pataudry. And it says here it's 78. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So yeah. So uh, your memories of playing at at Greenock at uh, Capello, Ken? Um, I think at the, at the beginning uh, I wasn't. You know, I I didn't I didn't actually play that well at Capello for some reason. It's always raining, always <laughs> pouring down at, 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 in in Greenock. And um, but I think later on, you know, into the the nineties, ninety one. Uh, I started to score a few. Uh, I remember one first game of the season actually after I'd won the golden boot yeah. when we uh, beat Partick seven one the last game. So we scored seven, and then we went to Capo the first game of the next season and won seven one as well. Yeah. Or was it was it seven nil? Seven one, seven one. I think yeah, yeah. seven one. Yeah. So, so I think I'd got four in the Partick game, and I got a hat trick that day as well. I think a couple of them were penalties, but that. In the early days, uh, it wasn't one of my happy, happy hunting grounds. But a great atmosphere at Capo, I must say. Um, mm. When Morton were playing well, when we were up there, I mean, you know, I used to support St Morton. Used to go to the derbies, and uh, you know, Andy Ritchie time and all that. I mean, they're a fantastic team, and the atmosphere was great at Capo. Yeah. But it's not really changed much, does it? No, <laughs> no, it hasn't changed. Oh, really? No. I, th I think yeah. that that's part of the attraction of it now, isn't it? I mean, yeah. When, it, when yeah. every other ground was like that, it was just like every other ground. But now it's like you know people go there for mm -hmm. the fact that it's you know st it's still a bit in the past, which is. You know. well, I think that game, the first game of that season, was the first time I actually seen grass on the park. Because <laughs> <laughs> every other time we played, it was muddy or because yeah. it was always raining. You yeah. know? But we got it in the first day of the season, and it was pretty good. <laughs> yeah, you, you were spoiling us at that that sort of period of time. Um, we just thought every game was going to be a seven-one victory, you know. And <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let us down. Uh, we had a fantastic team, um, and it it was just a pity we didn't we didn't turn it into a promotion or that because I never won anything at Claybank. Got the semis of the cup, and you know a lot of great cup ties at, at Kilbowie and. We missed out in promotion when we had our best team, you yeah. know, when Oni was up front with me and Tommy Bryce and 
Davy Irons and all. We had a fantastic team then. And we were picked, I think, by, was it Dunfermline maybe? Uh, I think St. Johnson Dunfermline had went up and we missed out. So I think that was the closest they came to ever getting a promotion. Yeah. And, and a lot but, of those guys obviously went on to play well with other, with other sides. But yeah. Owen Coyle and... Uh, yeah. Tommy Bryce and they all had, they all had good careers. I mean, on to have good yeah. careers. Yeah. So, yeah. so what? What? But you said I, I saw recently that there was a a chance for for you to move to Hibs, but that sort of <laughs> that yeah. sort of fell through. It was for, funny. <laughs> it was funny. I mean, I'll, I'll tell you the story. But you probably read it. it was on Facebook a couple of days ago. Yeah. They had a picture of um, uh, Jim Gray and the guy Duff, the chairman and the chief executive. And I was at uh, Falkirk at the time, and I was I was in dispute with them because David Clark obviously fell out with me, and he said, "Alec Miller wants to talk to you." Um, and I worked in Edinburgh at the time. Mm. I had a good job, and I was a management job in plant hire, and I had my part time with, with Falkirk. So you know, uh, I said, well, "Okay, I'll go along and have a chat with him." And Alec and Peter were great, sat in, and then this guy Jim Gray came into the into the room and he, he sat down and he said, uh, so what is it you do, son? And I said, uh, I, you know, I told him I was in management. And he, he turned around and said, he said, oh, well, the jobs in that industry are 10 a penny, son. <laughs> so uh, I I don't know if it was rude or not, but I just got up and told him to ram it. <laughs> um, that doesn't he, sound uh, rude, no. <laughs> yeah, the guy was, you know, it, it basically... I think I was probably between the two jobs uh, in my management job and, and, and Falker, but part-time wages were not bad. And uh, I was probably earning more than any Hibs first teamer in the time, at that time. And I had a company car. <laughs> With a company, right? Yeah. <laughs> so uh, um, he, he turned around and said, I'll give you a two-year contract uh, on less money. And... Uh, I said, but I've got a company car as well. He said, oh, no. He said, if it doesn't work out, son, you can buy a plant hire. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I just walked out. I walked out, and Peter Cormack chased me. He said, Kenny, he didn't mean that. He, I said, oh, tell me, ram it, you know. And But I like, I like to phone me that night, and I said, look, I, I can't possibly sign him. I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, for a two-year contract. I mean, I think at the time I was, I was 20, 27, 28, just before I signed McClay Bank. Um... Uh, so that ended that, mm. you know. So I probably could have been at Hibs, but whether I would have made the first team or not, it was a different story because there were a lot of good players there. I think Keithy Wright was there at the time, and maybe Graham Harvey and all these people, and you know, good strikers. Stevie, what's his name? Goal scorer. Uh, Cowan, um, Stevie Cowan. Stevie Cowan, yeah, yeah. So they, they had quite a good squad at the time. So whether I would have made the first team or not, you know, it was, you know, I don't know. So, I mean, I don't regret it um, mm-hmm. in any way because it wasn't long after that, uh, I same with Cl- uh, Clay Bank. Mm-hmm. You know, I took a drop down divisions from the Premier League to the First Division, but um, it suited me. It suited me fine. I think, plus, you've now got a better story out of it, telling me to beat it rather than well yeah the, the guy was a clown they were both <laughs> they were both charlatans yeah. Yeah, I don't think they lasted long these two you know and there's not any great stories going about about them yeah. So, yeah. Okay. so yeah that was that okay so on to the page page three or page four sorry um, the goal lines so this is um, readers letters and I'm, I'm picking one out here and the, the heading on it is drivel and it's from Mrs. Helen Newman from Crew, and she writes, I'm writing to complain about the drivel written by Frank Worthington in his focus. My son is football mad and loves finding out about players, but all he found out about Worthington is he must be a raving lunatic. Now, Worthington's focus from the previous week contained the following. Previous clubs, the Playboy, Tramps and Sandpiper. <laughs> Biggest disappointment, not getting the lead in the part in the television series The Incredible Hulk. Favourite other team, Bolton Markets Half Holiday Second Eleven. And who would you most like to meet? Elvis's widow, Priscilla. So, shoot and respond, say, Frank's focus brought us a lot of mail. Frank was obviously trying to have a joke. Let's not take the smile out of soccer. 
Yeah, sadly, as we know, Frank passed away recently, and just all, all mm. the stories that you read, you hear, um, it's it's all the same thing about him. He just sounds like an ad, you know, an absolute legend of a of a, a character. Um, I met him Monday once. I yeah. met him. Um, it's funny. Uh, it was after the Scottish Cup final, nineteen eighty-seven, we St Mirren the United, and. I was at the game, yeah. and I was up at uh, I was at Dundee United then because my mate was a United fan, <laughs> and we were we were flying out to Ibiza after the game. So I mean, obviously St Martin won, and I, I I couldn't I couldn't jump up and down because I was <laughs> in Dundee United then. Anyway, it goes back to um, I used to work in a bar in Paisley behind Love Street called the Cottage Arms. So I takes Harry into the bar. <laughs> he was raging. He was full of some fun. Right? <laughs> so uh, we had a couple of pints in there and I said, right, he said, oh, this is enough. Well, let's get to the airport. So we goes along to Glasgow Airport, gets to the check-in desk. Flight's delayed. All right, we'll go over to the, the old uh, Excelsior Hotel across the road. We'll have a pint in there. Uh, but it's before your time. I thought it's a Hilton now, isn't it? Yeah. Well, it was the Excelsior. So we goes in there for a pint. Sitting having a pint. And who comes in? The St Martin squad with a cup. <laughs> <laughs> this is a true story. An absolutely true story. <laughs> right? So my mate Harry was raging. Anyway, he gets over to Ibiza. I think it was the second night. He goes to a bar, just sitting there having a few beers. There's Frank Worthington in the, in the squad. They're on a pre-season break. Right? I think he was manager. Was he manager at Tranmere Rovers? I think it was Tranmere Rovers. He was manager at one time. Anyway, he was there with the whole squad and they were there for an absolute major piss up. And, <laughs> and it was really funny, you know, I was chatting away him for ages, but he didn't know me from Adam. Yeah, and if yeah. I said my name was Kenny, he said, who the hell are you, you know? But they were a great bunch of lads and he was fantastic. He was there with his open neck shirt on and his gold medallion <laughs> and all. And just, just what Frank Worthington was all about. Yeah, yeah. And uh, that was my memory. Met him, had a couple of beers, not with him, but in his... And he's sort of company, you know, it's good. So, Brilliant. yeah, it was a nice wee story. God rest them. Yeah, there was, um, we, we, who was it we spoke about this with recently, Tom? David Priest. Oh, David Priest. So we, there was an article and it showed you a photograph of him on his sofa with his, with his girlfriend <laughs> or his wife at that point. And in the background was a photograph of him, you know, sort of. <laughs> I think I I think he was topless on the either he was topless the on the sofa or he was topless yeah. in the photograph. I can't remember which, but it was just like that's brilliant, that's brilliant. And as you say, medallion yeah. as well. And I think actually yeah. there's um, there's an article, there's an advert in here for medallions later on. So that's maybe being part of the yeah. the whole Frank Worthington cu culture at it, the time. It was and basically draws this second to draws best, wasn't he? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Did you get the answer, Tom? Uh, I was Tranmere Rovers, Tranmere, yeah. Right. Was, uh, was, was it Tranmere? Tranmere yeah, there, yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought it was Tranmere. They just obviously finished their season, and they were off in a in a jolly. So, yeah. and just me you're talking there about um, watching St Mern win the Scottish Cup, Ken. Obviously, yeah. it, was you that, it was you that knocked them out the next season. Well, yeah, uh, at Love Street, yep. beat them three 0 That's right. And I um, play by debut. Uh, no, uh, the week before that, we played at Meadowbank. Um, and we got beat three two, and I think I think I, yeah I scored uh, in that game, and then the, f the following week it was a cup game, and um, I don't think anybody gave us a chance. Went there um, and played them off the park. Uh, I got two, and I think Brian Wright got the other one. Um, so yeah, that was I mean I, that was another funny story because my mate from Paisley, I mean I was born down the road from Love Street. And I met him after the game and we went to a pub where my dad used to drink called, called Boners in Caledonia Street uh, just for a pint. And I thought I would get my, you know, I'd lynched. But they were all coming over. Oh, well done, Ken. Local boy does good. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that was another good story. Yeah. Yeah. And then I think we knocked him out again. 1990, right? Now. Yeah, yeah. We went to Love Street and got a 1-1 one -one draw and then took them back to Kobawi and gave them a doing there. So... Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it was a bit, you know, it's a, it's a mum fan and, you know, knocking them out. But, yeah, I was paid by Clay Bank and that was it. <laughs> but the 3-2, the, the, the replay game at Kobawi, there was, um, was, was one of my favourite 
games of all time. Yeah, it was uh, midway. Probably his minus, uh, minus yeah. as well, Andy. Yeah. Yeah. It was just, um, you know, Kobawi full, which didn't happen that often, but full wow. packed. What what an atmosphere it was because it was so tight what? to the pitch as well. But all the games I've got good memories, apart from the party game, was uh, all under the lights midweek. Mm. You know, I remember the Aberdeen game, obviously. Yeah. Um, well, we, we lost 4 3, but the other game was when we knocked Deirdre out 2 0, and I got both of them that night. That was under the lights as well. Um, so these were all fantastic memories, and and it just showed that everybody hated coming to Kilbury. Mm. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so the, there's another, it's an advert on this page that I want to have a look at. So it's the Umbro official team strips, and we've got a wee photograph of a wee boy, and you know, cl close to if not the greatest Scotland football kit of all time. I had that kit as well, yeah. I was going to ask you that, if you, if you had the kit. Yeah. Um, I had it, Andy, yeah, definitely, yeah. yeah. I think I had uh, seven on the back of it, I don't yeah. wish. Yeah. <laughs> so so this this is a blue Scotland kit, the the Umbro Diamonds down the sides with a, it's a big wing collar with a, a V. It's not a V-neck, is it? Would you call that a V-neck? Or would you, what would you call that? I remember when it was windy, these... Uh, Aeroplane wings used to come up and hit you, and <laughs> if it was windy, oh, <laughs> you'd they, they, hit your chin. <laughs> nowadays, players would take a wee dive if if they felt contact, <laughs> wouldn't they? Um, but the, oh, this, I mean, they're classic. The socks were fantastic. Yeah, Umbro, you know, and it was a great strip. Mm. So what have we got um, price wise? So it goes up to thirty eight forty. So th those were the days where um, oversized wow. people just couldn't get any football gear, which is probably, <laughs> you know, I think that's fair enough, if I'm being honest. Yeah. So ten pound eighty. Ten pound eighty. Wow. Yeah. So this this is based was, based in. What's it? It was sixty quid for a top now, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> well, we, we spoke about this before. There was a, a, I think, it was certainly within the last year, but how Liverpool it was a kids kit. And it was something like 120 quid or something, maybe a bit more than that wow. for the kit for the kids yeah. one. And it's just like that's oh, just, I mean that's fleecing the fans because it you know, is, isn't it? Three, yeah. four kits as well, and it's yeah, mm -hmm. different days, different days indeed. Are you jumping over that letter there, uh, Andy? Conceited or confident? Go on. There's a letter from Ken Shaw of Bray who says, Andy Gray. Groan, yawn. Every fortnight he takes up valuable space and shoot with his bigoted, pig-headed remarks. He seems to have an exaggerated idea of his own importance. And uh, uh, Shoot's response is, far from being big-headed, Andy, as every striker should be, his confidence and his ability to score a lot of goals. What do you expect him to say, that he doesn't think he'll score? It's a, it's a bit... Um, I, don't, I don't know where he, he's getting the bigoted... Thing. I've never read that in any Andy Grace stuff. No, there's not even an an anti, like with Danny McGrain's stuff. There was there was always a bit of dig about England and things like that. You could tell Danny McGrain was not a fan England, and by that I mean mm -hmm. the football team. Um, mm -hmm. But they never got that feeling for Andy Gray. So I mean, I'm but I'm being big headed. Yeah, why not? I mean, if he's got the talent hey, to to back he it up, he had the talent. He was a fantastic strike, fearless, yeah. absolutely fearless. Yeah, and he wasn't that tall. I would, you know, would have been about five, five, eight, nine or something, was he? Maybe, a no, maybe the same as me, maybe five, ten or something like that. But I tell you what, he could jump. Mm. He was a fantastic, brave as hell in the box. You know, yeah. that's what that's what strikers should be. You yeah. know, it's, I watched him a lot, especially in his Everton days. That's when he was probably at the top of his game. Yeah. Well, I've, um, I've just finished reading his book, and in his book, it, he doesn't, he, he doesn't say that he was blessed with talent, blessed, blessed with ability, but, you know, it mm -hmm. was the work rate he did, the, the strength yep. he did, and, you know, the way that he, he just played the game. So, yeah, yeah, Ken, Ken Shaw, that's why I never spoke about it, Tom, because right. it gets me angry. That's why. <laughs> Ken Shaw, I'm coming after you. Um, is, there, is there anything else that I've missed on that? Uh, I don't think so. I just thought that was uh, interesting. Yeah, it certainly is. I'll, I'll be looking for Ken Shaw and... Um, Twitter and I'll be, I'll be <laughs> doing my piece of my mind. Well, there's an interesting <laughs> bit there, but they're, they're saying there's a letter there about Southampton have set aside a section of the deal for families. Uh, another example of one of the many good things Laurie McMenemy has done for soccer. It would be a good idea if other clubs followed suit as it enables parents to go to games with their children without the worry of being caught up in terrorist violence. 
Yeah, I thought that was interesting. That's just a, a family section, and obviously, not a lot of clubs had a family set, devoted family sections. So. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's it's definitely. I mean, things like that, and obviously the the old state of state. It's it's changed football, isn't it for the for the better? Most you know, mm. mainly for the better. I mean, we 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 hark back to you know not being able to stand and things like that and how, but. I'd I'd still rather have all seated stadiums without the violence that accompanied the game back in this sort of period, you know. Without a doubt. that was bad. It was bad back in that period, yeah, yeah. especially when I, when I was a supporter. I mean, I, I gave up the game when I was fifteen. Uh, no, it sounds it sounds like I've gave it up for years. But I I went junior when I was sixteen and the Larks, and um, I got fed up with it because a lot of the ex pros. Uh, that um, that went down the divisions, went junior, and it was really tough for a sixteen-year-old to get against all these ex-pros. And I got the, the crap kicked out of me every week, and, mm. and then I just got fed up with it. Um, and that's when I went to follow St Mirren, and I went to all these games. Like I remember one at Claybank went on Christmas, last oh, ever game on Christmas Day, I believe. Uh, it was a two-two draw, and the violence was incredible. There was no segregation. Yeah. And there was bottles flying back and forward, and I think it was about ten thousand at the game. Yeah. Um, and I always remember that game. But other games that I went to as well. I went to a game at Love Street. Um, it was Dundee United against St Mirren in the Scottish Cup, and it was snowing again. No segregation. My, I went with my uncle. He got hit with a bottle. He got hit with a flying bottle, and it was like, wow, this this just went on every week. Yeah. At games. I went to another game and I seen a young boy getting a dart thrown at him. But you're right, you know, it, they, those days were, were pretty lethal. And, mm. and and then when it came to, I'm not decrying the old firm, but it was it was torture when you went. I went to a couple of these games and it was like, wow, bottles raining down on your own fans. Yeah. You know? You might not remember that, Andy, but in the 70s, you know, it, I stood at the, the Copeland Road end at Ibrox. I went to a game with one of my friends, Celtic game, and I think Celtic scored, and all the bottles came down through the Rangers end, you know, onto their own fans, you know, at the Copeland Road yeah. end. You're like, wow, you know, it's just, it's madness, absolute madness. So, yeah, I mean, things have changed for the better. Yeah, I, th- I, th- I think, you know, enough time has passed, and, you know, hopefully the the attitude of fans has changed that we can start thinking about the safe standing a bit more. I think that that's yeah. a possible option. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, as, as great as it is seeing, uh, you know, a big wave of, you know, if somebody scores a goal and you see the, the, the terracing behind it, the wave of fans coming and it looks fantastic, you know, but mm-hmm. how frightening it must be to be in amongst that. And, you yeah, know, when they were swaying forward yeah. and back, yeah. And they had these metal, they had these metal stances. You, st- you got behind one of them, you were crushed. Yeah, yeah. And you know, and it was, it was pretty nerve wracking at taste because you've seen, you know, the whole. Remember the cop? Yeah. When Liverpool scored, it was back and forward. You know, mm. it must have been pretty frightening. I, I still, I still um, liking the. So we we spoke briefly, and I'm sure we'll speak more about it. The the Thistle game, the seven one game. I still liking <laughs> that fourth goal you scored when it was like a mini Mexican wave. Could be people running down over the benches to get to the front. And let's face it, those benches could be a bit dangerous when they were when they were wet. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> they were slippy, weren't they? <laughs> yeah, yeah t- taking a few dunts on that. Okay. Yeah. I was. It was after that Christmas uh, Day game that uh, Jack Steedman installed the fence uh, to separate Down the middle, the eyes yeah. so, so that there was segregation uh, from, yes. the next, from the next season. They put that in. Oh, w- w- was it? Was it right after? Uh, that it was, it was was it? because of that. It's because of that. Basically, because of that game. <sighs> uh, the, the start of the following season, they put that. They put that fence in. Mm-hmm. It's it's a, it's a it was a crazy day and time to have a game anyway because you know all the, all the the husbands and stuff are, had a few swallows as soon as they've they've woken up and they've been drinking all day and the missus has probably chucked them out of the house and says right come on you get out of him under my feet and off they go to come the back for your dinner yeah and off they go to the football and it's like <laughs> yeah. it's a recipe for for disaster that so uh, no but was that Tom was that one the last game played on Christmas Day. Yeah, it was. Uh, so there was, was it Albion Rovers, East Stirling or somebody? There was another game that day, but they kicked off at 11 in the morning. Yeah. 
to basically get people home for Christmas dinner. But our mm. game kicked off at, at three o'clock. And so that was the last Christmas Day game in, in Scotland. Mm. So, yeah. so, so we may but, have not been the, the, the first all-seated stadium in Scotland, but we stopped Christmas Day football. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, moving on a couple of pages. It's We're at talking about Bill Shankly. So it says, what Bill Shankly misses most, and it's been totally involved. So let's have a look at this. So Shankly's arrival on Merseyside on the 1st of December 1959 with his unquestionable zest and genius for inspiring players is what drove Liverpool on to triumph after triumph. In a move that astonished the football world, the famous Scott retired to hand over the reins to Bob Paisley soon after Liverpool had secured the FA Cup win with a 3-0 win over Newcastle United in 1974. And Bill says, But I am still committed to the game in other ways, in many aspects and in different forms. For example, my advice may be sought in connection with a particular player or a certain situation. So football is part of my life. Of course, this is not the same as giving 100% of yourself to management. And it is in this sense of being in the thick of things I find hard to replace. And Shankly keeps fit with regular training sessions in a field near his home. He gave his views on rivals Everton, saying, Everton so far this season have proved themselves to be a strong side, one that is hard to beat. But something more is needed, though possibly an improvement in the attack before the team achieves all-round balance. On Liverpool, he says, they are well placed to win the championship again and at Anfield, this is what is expected of the first team. Action and movement is what they have to provide in their game. On bringing players into Liverpool, he says, Ian St John and Ron Yeats are the best buys I ever made. Consider what I paid for them. 37500 for Ian and 30000 for Ron. And then take into account the service they provided for the club and it's easy to see they were first class bargains. He keeps a keen eye on how his country is shaping up in international football and is optimistic about their future. He says the Scotland squad taken to Argentina was the strongest ever. They almost had too many men to choose from. There's plenty of talent available with Archie Gemmo, in my opinion, a terrific driving force in midfield. But in recent years, I've been disappointed in England, who have failed to come up to expectations. They have the men to build a successful side if the right players are chosen and channeled in the right direction. So there's a few things to pick out there. Um, one is, you know, is a, he is an absolute, you know, we, we do use the, the word legend quite freely, but Bill Shankly is an absolute legend. Um, but I love the fact, you know, it says that he keeps himself fit with regular training sessions in a field near his home. And it's just the, the picture of that just being a like a field with cows or something in it and he's he's running about chasing them or something like that. That It's a great image in my head anyway. But then... You know, he's, he's quite forthright about Everton, you know, and, and, and we've noticed this a few times, well, more than a few times in the articles back this sort of period, and, you know, quite a quite a long period where, OK, he's not in the game anymore, but quite often there's players who are giving honest opinions on fellow professionals and things like that, which you, you just wouldn't get nowadays, you know, it, it, because they're, they're media trained, uh, they don't want to rock the ball and things, so it's, it's refreshing to hear. I'm, I'm actually just giving his opinion. And then there's a bit about Scotland going to Argentina and saying it was the strongest ever squad, which potentially it, it could have been. You know, it is a case of... And, it, uh, you know, the fact that he says um, maybe we just had too much talent to choose from, is, is it certainly is food for thought that, you know, maybe Alan, Alan McLeod, there was, if, if there was a smaller pool in which they focus on, maybe maybe we'd have picked made some better decisions in, in players I don't know so any any comments on Bill Shankly any of that well he's a legend isn't he total total legend uh, and then everything that followed him you know obviously uh, Paisley and uh, who was next um, Joe Fagan Joe Fagan yeah Joe Fagan and it's just been going on ever since I mean Liverpool a fantastic club and I, I'm glad that um uh, they're back to well, obviously win the league last year. They've not had a great season this year, but I think they're back to where they should be. Yeah, yeah, so it's certainly a great club. But you know, like so many, I think it does good for clubs to occasionally have a bit of pain, to have a wee bit of sort of realism about the fact that you know you can't have success year after year after year. Um, and it's you know they just need to be, which I think that, that they had that period where they hadn't won the league for so long. And I think it sort of did ground them a bit. So when, mm -hmm. when they do win it, you can you can feel 
um, a bit more happy for them. You know what I mean by that? It's like if, if teams. Just well, keep... yeah, I mean, I, I remember when Blackburn won it. You know, I, I used to love watching Shearer and Sutton mm. and all these people, and it was a breath of fresh air. Blackburn winning the league, and then obviously Leicester done it a few years ago, and so I mean, I, I do like the underdog, yeah. um, but it's difficult for them to sustain it all the time yeah. because obviously money's a huge driver. And just reading all that crap about this European League recently, it's just, you know, I'm 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 delighted it's not going ahead. Um, I don't know if you were going to talk about that, but that's that's just, it's all been instigated by, um, I think it's all been instigated by far too many players getting paid far too much money in clubs now. Obviously the COVID thing, gate receipts are not a massive part of all these European clubs' income, but it certainly helps. Mm. And you know. When you think of all these players that are getting paid like over six figures a week, yeah. sometimes twice, three times that, you know, good luck to you. You signed them. So this is their way of just trying to generate money to, to balance the books, hmm. and it ain't going to happen. So I often think, you know, the amount of money that's in the game, if, and listen, if, if somebody's going to offer you 400, 500,000 pounds a week, you're not going to say, no, that's too much, are you? I agree with you. But um, agree with you. you just think what good that money could do if spent better than that. You know, talking about grassroots, mm-hmm. especially, you know, mm-hmm. community and things. You know, because this is what's made the clubs from the start. You know, big clubs, mm-hmm. huge clubs have been made that way because of the supporters in the past. That That's mm-hmm. the only reason that they're, they're now where they are. Well, where they are now is pro- probably some of them are because money's come in. But I just think... Mm-hmm. That all that money that is in the game and then goes straight out of the game, and it's just so sad. It's so sad. But you're right about the. I'm quite happy to talk about that Super League. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I, I just I've said I said years ago, maybe ten years ago, when Sky were pumping all this money into the English Premier League, I said if Sky hit problems, the English Premier League will collapse. It will totally collapse. I mean, to give clubs. I mean, this is like five, six years ago, to give clubs 50 million for getting relegated. I mean, that just, to me, it's not right. (laughs) So you get 50 million for being uh, a failure. (laughs) So to help you bounce back up again, (laughs) it shouldn't work like that. I mean, there's far too much money getting paid by by these television companies. And they're actually going to, if that European league had went ahead, they would have fleeced you even more for it. Hmm. Well, I said about that that I, I honestly could quite confidently say if that went ahead, I would not have watched a single game of it, and it wouldn't Me have too. been it wouldn't have even been as a protest thing. It's just simply mm-hmm. because even now, um, my interest in Champions League and Premiership and all that is is waning pretty quickly. Simply because mm-hmm. because there's too much money, because I I think it's 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 too samey, you know, same teams all the time and. Mm-hmm. This this super league would would just take that to another level, and it's like nah, mm-hmm. I wouldn't be interested. It, it would be like having um, and no disrespect to something like um, gymnastics or something on the telly. I just you know I wouldn't mm-hmm. have any interest in watching it, and that's what the super league would be. Me. Or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think what what most people are saying. What is the point in competing in a league if there's no there's, there's nothing to win? There's no relegation. There's no promotion. What's the point of it? Mm. You know, what you, you're just going there to make up the numbers, aren't you? It's just... Yeah. Well, we've seen we've seen it for years with the with the Premier League and the Champions League, where it was considered a success for Arsenal to finish outside yeah. top spot, and it's like, mm-hmm. well, that 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 shouldn't be the case. You know that mm-hmm. if they don't win a trophy, but they get into the Champions League, then that's a success. And I guess it's a success in financial terms and in terms of putting the, the team out there and playing against the bit, but you're still not winning anything. And as you you've said, no. it's like your your regret was no winning anything that no you know, having something from Clyde Bank. And that's that's what mm-hmm. surely drives you in the game. Of course it is. Yeah. The, I think the, the Champions League again it's all about the money. It, but it's been a bit devalued. They say it's the Champions it's not the Champions League. Yeah. You know, you've got four clubs for England, there's got you've got four clubs for Italy, four clubs I mean so, what, finishing uh, fourth, you're not champions of the league, you know. And then you've got other other countries where, uh, obviously, Scotland, the Rangers, Celtic win the league. 
they don't automatically they've got three games to qualify to get into Champions League. Yeah. You yeah. know, when somebody like Brescia or uh, Sassuolo from Italy can qualify being fourth, you know, it's like it, I think it's totally devalued. Yeah. Back to the uh, but again, it's difficult when you look at other other nations, uh, other countries. If if they win the league, they're not going to go that far in the Champions League. But it, to me, it should be the champions of each country yeah, get yeah. to the champions. Yeah, get and the do, Champions League. And do you know my thoughts on it? Is if it's not, just change the name. I would live. Yeah. I'd, I'd be fine. I'd be like, right, okay. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's, Winners League. Yeah. <laughs> or you know the yeah. European Super League. Let's call it that because yeah. that's that's what it's it is. Like that. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. Yeah, it's just the fact that they're calling it the Champions League, and it's like. That that's what annoys me more, more than anything else. Just change the name, and then I'll I'll, I'll not be as upset. It was like way back <laughs> at the, the beginning of the magazine. Then when Saturday comes, called it the Champions and, and their Rich Mates League, because that's <laughs> basically, what, basically what, they were, what they were doing. And I, I've been saying for a long time, the Champions League has just been like an invitational. So like one of the pre-season tournaments you see with Arsenal and Melbourne Knights mm-hmm. and Paris Saint Germain, and that's yeah. where this European Super League just just was. It's just a, an invitational. And, and mm-hmm. it's, it's kind of, in a way, when you look back to something like the Home Internationals, and the Home Internationals kind of ended because like England and Scotland didn't want to play Northern Ireland and Wales. They wanted to play Brazil and Argentina. They wanted to generate bigger friendlies with bigger income. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of what this has become. Big teams are they're fed up. They don't want to play Olympiacos, Sparta, Prague. They just want to yeah. keep playing Real Madrid, Barcelona. They want to play yeah. the, the elite yeah. clubs. All the yeah. time, and this is this is what it's been. But but like you were saying, Ken, I mean, I think for some reason this has been a massive line in the sand for people. But I wonder why when Ajax and Celtic, like who'd won like five European Cups between them, had to had to go into a qualifier because <laughs> yeah. winning the Real yeah. League wasn't enough to get them into that two yeah. five times between them. Yeah, yeah, right, Tom. Yeah, and the other thing as well is. Um, if you finish third in your group in the Champions League, you, you go into the UEFA Cup. Yeah, you're like, what is it? I mean, you're rewarding failure again. Yep. You know, yeah. what are all these other, what are all these, all these other clubs through the league stage in the Europa League thinking when all of a sudden, you know, uh, say Juventus don't qualify, they finish third, all of a sudden they drop into U- Europa League. <laughs> There's no chance. Yeah. <laughs> so yep. again, it's, it's, it's rewarding failure. For yeah. anybody that doesn't make the top two in the group stays in the Champions League to go into the Europa League, I yeah. think that's just mad. I know because again, because the Europa League, you've got a tournament where the finalists are two teams who only in that tournament when the season started. Absolutely, uh, yeah, that's what dinner. I meant. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know. I, I, I don't. I don't like it either. Will you get that? Sort of a, sort of, I think you know. did Seville Seville win it twice in a row, but they were in the Champions League. Yeah, yeah. Originally, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Story. <laughs> what you say, Tom, about you know being an invitation that that's what it should be. I think if they want to go down that route, then why not just automatically let, let all the champions in, and then the playoffs are the invitees. So all yeah. the you know third place, whatever, all these they have to they have to you know earn the place. Earn it. They need yeah. to earn and it. It's, yeah. But it's just yeah. that because they don't want to end up playing Shamrock Rovers and Shamrock Rovers and Valletta of Malta and. You know, like yeah. I say, the champions of Greece, you know what I mean? Well, yeah. Milan and, you know, uh, Juventus are sitting in the sidelines because they see Milan mm-hmm. won the Italian league, you know? Yeah, well, yeah. If, if, I, if I see another Bayern Munich versus PSG or Real Madrid versus Chelsea game, I'll be like, ah, that's me, man, I'm done. You know, it's... Yeah. Like, but, but, oh, there's one on tonight, isn't there? Is yeah, it PSG? Real, Real Madrid, Chelsea. Was it Real Madrid, Chelsea? Yeah, and which, which years going by would be a, a massive game you'd be excited about, but now you're like... Mm. Yeah, and the other one's PSG Man City, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, but yeah, be, before I blow, I can't wait for this, you know. And but I mean, I'm I'm lucky I don't get it here. I don't watch it. Mm. <laughs> we can get I get the English Premier League here, but um, I very rarely, very rarely watch an English Premier game. Obviously, because of the COVID thing, there's no final atmosphere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, I, I've just just watched here all four Scottish Cup quarterfinals that were on the telly this weekend. It was all cracking games. I don't know. Oh, St. So, so Mullen got you another got you another Scottish Cup semi final. I don't know if you mm-hmm. watched that game last night, Andy. It was terrific. Mm-hmm. Th- th- each after extra time, they put five phone penalties. I was like, what I, was the score? Well, I know St. Mullen got through. Who were they playing yesterday? Uh, Kilmarnock. 
What was the score, Tom? It was it was two each after ninety minutes. Then what was it? Each team got a penalty kick in extra time. So I was at Mirren scored a late equaliser in ninety minutes, and then they got a late equaliser in one hundred and twenty minutes, and then they mm-hmm. won five four penalties. Wow! Brilliant. I was crying the game in uh, Hibs. Yeah. Motherwell went to penalty kicks two each. Uh, Rangers one went to penalties. Uh, Rangers one went to penalties, which was which was exciting as well. Off off four. Yeah. Scottish Cup quarterfinals were really exciting. Oh, here's here's hoping St. Man United final up for me. <laughs> 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 a rerun of 87 make, yeah, make sure good. you get in the right end this time Ken. <laughs> I know yeah <laughs> do you know what we're, we're talking about um, what, one thing that bugs me and I've mentioned it a few times is seeding in competitions I'm, I'm so anti-seeding as well because it's, mm-hmm. it's just it's about favouring the big teams and it's like just I think there, there's something in this magazine where um, I think Celtic Rangers are in the first round of the, the cup and there's other teams come in later and it's like that just doesn't happen these days but I just think Cup competitions, don't seed, just put it in a hat, draw them, yeah, and it's a lucky. And if you get the two biggest teams playing the first round, so be mm, it. Tough. That's yeah. yeah, yeah, never had it years and years ago, did they? No. It was just got on with it. And you always, as a Simon fan, I always sat and just, oh, I hope we get, I hope we get Rangers at home or Celtic at home or yeah. whatever, you know, and it was oh, he's stolen away. <laughs> <laughs> but then you know you've got a chance to get to the next round, so yeah. it's like, yeah, you're right. Remember the old League Cup you used to do yeah. it in sections. You used just to do a group say, section. You know, I'm just going to say that 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 was always that was always exciting when you would get that. It'd be, you know, Celtic mm-hmm. would be in a group of East Fife or whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, but but again, Celtic and Rangers want to play big preseason friendlies against yeah. you know Arsenal and Paris Saint Germain or whatever. I uh, know they, they don't want to be in, in a League Cup section with St Johnston and you know Alloa. Yeah, yeah. Right, so so I think we've sorted it out. So we're changing the let's not change the name. It let's make it invitees have to play off to get into the the champions league with all the champions, and let's get away with seeding. So yeah. we, we, we sorted that. I, I mean, I'm happy to write a letter to FIFA and tell them that's what's happening. Right, okay, okay. <laughs> I was going to put your name to it. Okay. I'll, I'll send mine to Jim Farry and Ernie Walker. Oh, they are they still there? <laughs> I, hope, I hope not I hope not um, right let's move on to page 10 so we're going to have a look at this soccer films advert it says relive great moments of soccer on your 8mm projector the world's biggest range of home movie FA and League Cup finals World Cup European Championships and international games so you send 40 pence for a brochure in full range some of the ones um, mentioned is the 1977 Scotland 2, England 1. It was the World Cup 1978. Um, both above show photos of the actual boxes they come in. Uh, it also includes the 1967 Scotland 3, England 2 game on 400 foot reel. Some of the Scottish finals mentioned Rangers 3, Hearts 1 from 76, Rangers 3, Celtic 2 and Celtic 6, Hibs 1 from 1972. And there's also the European Cup final from 67 and 200 foot or 400 foot reels so that you can actually buy projectors here as well it says a silent movie projector offer for £19.50 shows up to 200 foot reels it shows black and white and silent colour films and -hmm. there's a 400 foot reel silent projector for £29.50 and there's a sound projector for £98 that's a right jump that you know the prices Um, nearly a hundred pound back then, and to get to get sound is is quite quite something else. Would you would you have ever had anything like this, or in in the family, or any relatives, or had a projector? My my uh, father in law has got old footage. I think he had one of these. He's got old footage of obviously my wife, his and his uh, other daughter. Because when they do these family videos, when it's their birthday, they stick them on, and my wife goes mad. <laughs> <laughs> She's running about the beach yeah. doing in socos or something like that, or whatever it was. <laughs> but yeah, I'm pretty sure he had uh, he had one yeah. um, one of them. I didn't. Yeah, no, I've I've mentioned it again before that you know I quite like the there's, there's a bit of a a romantic idea of of sitting in a, you know in a darkened room. With the with the wearing of the the projector in the background watching the, um, but what we did find out I think from Jim Burke when he when he was on the podcast is the photograph of that projector there isn't that far off life size, <laughs> he says it's it's a small projector so you know it's not like a big cinema one or anything like that, 
Um, but yeah, it's something. The, G, the G, GVC handicap, <laughs> like still game. Remember that one? <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, um, let's move on to pages eleven to fourteen. So the eleven to fourteen is shoot would occasionally provide a series in the magazine that the readers could pull out and make into a booklet. Um, it builds up over the weeks. So the next four pages in this magazine are such pages. Given the nature of the photos, two separate ones on each page, it looks to have an international theme to it. Um, so the pages get folded in half and put together. And the ones that are shown is there's the uh, managers of the past from England. And it's a brief run through of England managers from Walter Winterbottom through to current manager Ron Greenwood. Paul Futcher of England and Man City. And the other ones are Trevor Francis of England and Birmingham, Malcolm Page, Wales and Birmingham City. And we've got Martin O'Neill, uh, Northern Ireland and Nottingham Forest. And Martin's picture fighting off Dave Watson of England. And we've also got Tom Forsyth. So each photo page is also has a small profile of the player along with some facts such as age, height, weight, birthplace, previous club, etc. Now for O'Neill, it says he was a former law student at Queen's University in Belfast. He's played more league games for Forest than anyone else on the current staff, having played over 200 games. Even though he was dropped earlier in the season by Brian Clough, Martin will remain a regular for his country with his hard work and often overlooked technique. Now, next up is Tom Forsyth of Rangers in Scotland. And the photo shows Tom in the dark blue of Scotland, moving forward with the ball while Aberdeen Stuart Kennedy looks on in the background. His profile reads, Scotland are lucky to have three top-class sweepers in Tom, Martin Buchan and Kenny Burns. Jaws, as he was nicknamed, is a firm favourite with the Ibrox crowd, who love no his no-nonsense approach to the game. Quick in the tackle, dominant in the air, and valuable at set pieces and attack. And as we know, absolutely deadly from half a half an inch out. Um, if we remember that 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 goal. Um, now, just something to mention is down the middle. So there's a there's a dotted line down the middle separating them with a couple of black dots. And what you would do is you would punch a hole through those and it'd be a, a bit of string with some metal connectors and you would that would be used to bind these together as well. So the, the last two photographs is of Northern Ireland. Uh, one is facts and figures for Northern Ireland and the other is goalkeeper Alan O'Neill of the Republic of Ireland. Alan plays for Shamrock Rovers and was promoted to first choice keeper by a new manager, Johnny Giles. So things like that, I always liked seeing photographs and especially photographs maybe team photos of teams you wouldn't normally hear about or know about occasionally there was a bit of um, the republic island news in the magazine but not not a great deal but then you would get team photos like Anderlecht or yeah, malmo and things like that and it was just you know sort of going back again to this fact about you know in european football it's it's good when you come up against teams you don't know because it's it's a bit of excitement, it's something new. And the same with this, just getting new photographs. I always found that really, really exciting in here. Um, and do you want to talk anything about Tom Forsyth or Martin O'Neill? Yeah, I've got, I've got, I mean, he was always by me, Tommy McLean's side, wasn't he? Because uh, every time I played with uh, Falkirk, I used to score against Motherwell and Big Tom hated it. And uh, Brian Wright told me a great story, Andy and Tom, about him. Um, when he was at Motherwell, he went in and he said to Tom, Tom, I've, I've not got any boots. My boots are needing replaced. And uh, Tom's like, no, nah, you're not getting any new boots. And Brian said, come on, I need new boots. New... So big Tom followed him into the boot room. He says, there's your boots hanging up there. You know, it, it, it had BR on it. Brian Wright, BR. <laughs> they, were Bobby, they, were, they were Bobby Russell's boots. <laughs> <laughs> That's a bright told me, and I was oh, like, bright. "Can you stop laughing?" <laughs> but that was big time. Great, he was a fantastic player. Yeah. Well, you, you you say that you know you hated the sight of you because you always scored to them. I know certainly St Johnston fans feel exactly the same about about that oh, as well. Yeah. So there's, there's not yeah. a lot of love for you from St Johnston fans, but in a good way. In a good way. Yeah, I had a not as many as probably I scored against other clubs, but. Um, Always, uh, I think we one of the games we played, uh, I think they just won the league. And then we played them at Kilbowie and we absolutely thrashed them 4-0. Uh, I think Craig Flanagan got a hat-trick and I got one that day. It was the last game of the season. And we were like, why are they going up and we're not? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we all, all obviously 
played the first. I had a, a good wee conversation with you know Jim Hughes that used to play with. Us. Yeah. 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 Well, Jimmy, um, he put on Facebook the other day uh, something about McDermott Park, and he said it was a question to Frank McDougal. And he said, who scored the first ever goal at McDermott Park? And I went on, I said, oh, it was your legend. And I said, thanks, Ken. <laughs> <laughs> but I, we played the first ever game at yeah. McDermott. And I think you know, we lost 2-1, but Jimmy scored the first ever goal there. Yeah. Just as you mentioned there, uh, Craig uh, Flanagan there, Ken, who was your, did you have a favourite strike partner at Claybank? I uh, had a few. Um, and, uh, obviously, you played a lot of good players, but I was wondering if there yeah. was somebody that you felt complimented you better than... Um, well, obviously, Craig in the later days, because he always fed off me. He knew that any time I was going up, I was have, you know, an 8% chance of winning it and knocking it on. And Craig always read that and went in, the, in behind, and he got a lot of his goals through that, you know, because he was quick. He was really quick. Mm-hmm. Oni was a bit different. We had a good... Well, the great season. Me, me, him and Tommy Briggs. I don't know many we scored maybe 80-odd goals between us, but that was uh, that was another fantastic partnership. No, I had a lot of lot of good lot of good strike partners in my time. Maybe not in the in the, the other clubs, but at Clay Bank, yeah, yeah. But probably you know, only me and him was probably the most successful for goals. But probably you know for com- feeling comfortable round about them because I knew Flanny used to do a, most of my work because I was pretty lazy at times, <laughs> and <laughs> as you know, and and Flanny done done a lot of the work but I don't know what is he still at Rangers I was he was coaching I or is he doing community, he was, was he doing a community thing at one time and then I couldn't see the last time I heard no him. no Craig, Craig was a great wee striker Jimmy Grady was you know yeah. another one Jim, James was, uh, he was he was probably as good as me in the air for his height yeah. um, he could leap again a bit like me selfish he always wanted to score which is good in a striker. Hmm. Um, so Jimmy as well. Before that, I'm trying to think who I played with the early days. Obviously, Chick was there, Chick Charnley. Tommy Bryce. I mean, I played with Tommy. I had a conversation recently with one of my old teammates at Kamana called John McClurg. John and I were obviously not good enough to get in the first team, but we went through the number of players that were at Kilmarnock at the time when we were you know, when Jim Clooney was there. And I could pick an 11, which would grace the first division at the moment. Yeah. And Tommy Bryce was one of them. Mm. Um, Tommy was one of my favourite players. Um, Tanner Ball player. <laughs> yeah. He's just amazing. And obviously he complimented me as well at Clay, at Clay Bank. Yeah. So so we we'll, we'll spoke about um, my friend before, Alan, Alex Nesevich, who... With the <laughs> Queen of South, and he, he, you know, he, he talks about you as um, like James Bond. You know, he's just the super cool <laughs> character and things like that. But he, he's nothing but praise for him. Nothing but praise for, for for him. You know, saying you know he's probably one of the best players he's played played alongside. So yeah. Mm-hmm. So d- just um, you know, Tom asked there about the favourite striker. Who would have been the best player that you would have played alongside in all your clubs? Only one in it, David Cooper. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> David, um, I probably I knew you were going to ask me that, but Coop was. Uh, he came for his second spell, obviously. Um, it was just everybody just loved him. Mm. You, know, and yeah. you could never get the ball off him at training. You know, with that left peg of his. And, but obviously, best player I've ever played with, without a doubt. Yeah. And did did he really lift the, the team when he when he came in? Were you so excited oh, about for, joining? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. It was the same when Terry Butcher came in. You know, Big Terry came in for yeah, a few games yeah. when when Jack was, uh, we were short of centre-halves and Jack was scouring about to try and get, I think Sweeney was injured, Tom Curry was injured, all these big centre-halves. And, and then he announced the training one thought, oh, here's, here's my new centre-half and Big Terry walks into the dressing room. <laughs> and the first thing he said to me actually was, oh, you're the reason I've got to wear a gum shield, didn't you, Mr. <laughs> Eddie? I remember, honestly, I remember, <clears throat> I think I played with Falkirk at the time, we went to Ibrox in the League Cup, and I was playing up front, and uh, one of my flailing elbows is, is normal, and I think I, bro- I broke or cracked one of his teeth, and Big Terry wore a gum shield after that. But, you know, all due respect to him, he came in, and 
the guys were like, whoa, Messiah, <laughs> you know. And I remember him, I don't know if it was his first game, but we went to Dunfermline and we got beat. I, I, I played all right, I think, and I think I scored, but we got beat and he came in after the dressing room and um, I think Brian Wright was the man at the time. But he let Terry do the talking and he stood up and he ripped into all this because a lot of these young boys were full-time at the time. And uh, he ripped into all these young lads because, you know, they hadn't got their finger out their backside. And he said, yeah, look at that boy, he did it. Look at him, he's bloody worked all his life. Played part-time football and he's given more than any use. And I was sitting there, Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> And I felt a bit embarrassed. About it, but, um, and then obviously I invited the big man to come and play my testimonial, yeah. which... You know, he very kindly did. So, uh, and I remember when going out, going out on the the warm up at my testimonial, he said uh, he came over and put his arm around me when all the fans were coming in. He said, "Ching ching, Kenny, yeah, this is good, isn't it? Look at all that money." <laughs> so that was big tell, yeah. So yeah, I mean, obviously played with him, but but Davy Davy was probably the, my uh, my top pick. Yeah, just the. Uh... Turn that a wee bit more morbid, Ken. How how was it after after he passed away? You sort of pick pick yourselves up and start playing again. How difficult was it? It was very difficult. I remember a conversation we had on the Tuesday night at training because I was assistant coach at the time, and Coop was one of the coaches, and Brian was obviously head coach. And we used to train uh, out in the Red Blaze at the back of Cobewi, yeah. and uh, Coop had taken the second team out into the main park, onto the track, to give them a bit of running. First team were on the Red Blaze. We were doing some two-touch stuff, as we did out the back. That's how we were so good, because it was all, all about the ball. So after Coop had run the reserves ragged, they obviously came to join us. And then we played a few games of two-touch. And I said to Coop, standing at the wall at the back of Kobawi, I said, you joining in? He went, no, I'm not up for it. And then I get the phone call the next day about, I don't know, 11 o'clock from Jack. Davey's been rushed into hospital. And that was the following day right. when he was at um, Broadwood. Yeah. Doing the coaching thing yeah, with Charlie Nick, was it? Yeah. 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 I get the call from Jack saying that Davey's, you know, been rushed into hospital. He's had a brain hemorrhage. And, um, but it was really difficult to pick everybody up because it was so somber for the next yeah. few weeks, you know. And then obviously, um, well, with funeral and all that as well, it was just, I was there, it was heartbreaking. Yeah. It was only, what, 39? Yeah. You know? I know. Well, I mean, it was a death, it was, it was felt by the whole of Scott, not just Scottish football, but it was, it was a, a national tragedy as, as well. Mm -hmm. At the time, I think a lot of people kind of forget. You know, he was a he was a plain he was a clay bank player at the time, and uh, mm -hmm. obviously mm -hmm. everybody at clay bank were sort of left to sort of go on be finishing that season. Yeah, uh, with, with them. I know, I know. It's really sad. The other one that springs to mind as well was um, again we played in that one was after Norrie Nor yeah. McCarthy died in November. Yeah. You know, we unfortunately had to go to East End Park and play in that game and. That was yeah. another hor horrible because Norrie was a great lad as well. He was, you know, he, I wouldn't say he's a friend of mine, but we got on really well. We battled against each other, and he was Mister Dunfermline, just mm. like Cook was Mister Claybank. Mm. So yeah, yeah, I know a lot of no, it was hard. It was really hard, really hard after it to pick myself up. You know, and, uh, yeah, sadly missed. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. yeah. No, it still is. He's still well remembered, obviously, by Claybank, mm -hmm. Claybank yeah. fans. Yeah. Uh, nobody, nobody ever saw him, forgot him, and, and what uh, a few of the guys have, have said to me is like when the, the club went out of business and came back, you know, they said it's no coincidence. It was all the guys that really were there at the time Davy Cooper first came through that were sort of at the heart of building the club back up mm -hmm. again, you know, because it was that kind of that kind of yeah. Well, you know. <laughs> yeah, I, I still I saw sort, of, sort of follow on uh, social media um, how how Clybank are you know doing, obviously. Um, the, the chairperson, Grace, yep. uh, Grace McGibbon, is um, her and the rest of the, the, the people behind her are doing a fantastic job. Yep. Uh, Bill Abrahams, young Paul Cummins. Paul was, <laughs> Paul was a ball boy when, when I played. And uh, 
I believe he's a little bastard in the black now. He's a referee, isn't <laughs> he? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I still uh, I still talk to him now and again on Facebook, uh, and I think he's doing um, he's doing the membership thing now, yeah. helping out. So I mean, I, I had a tear in my eye um, a couple of weeks ago when they showed them. Um, was it BBC Scotland showed? Yeah, yeah. The famous when we used, you know, when we used to be famous, mm-hmm. and um, it just brought back all these fantastic memories. And these guys are in this documentary. Yeah, good. Well, good luck to them. I'm hoping that uh, I think it was last season cancelled when they were sitting top of the league. Yeah. That's shame, man, eh? because they were doing really well. I think they'd only been, I don't think they'd been beaten, had they? No, they hadn't. They? No, they were playing yeah. they were doing really well. Eh? And of course, yeah. the club had made an effort to the games all streamed live as well. Mm. Yeah, that's true. Aye, eh? yeah. Which was good. Yeah. And we played more games in Kelty, haven't we? Aye. You know, uh, I think you? They, they played three games or something. Was it three games, two aye. games, three games? And was it eight, mm-hmm. eight we'd played? I think we should have given us a league. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. we've, we've talked about other well, super league and stuff like that, but when it comes down to it, we want we we want part of that. Come on, we want yeah. the league. <laughs> <laughs> I've been it'd be nice to get by. I mean, another heartbreaking thing for me as well as the the demise of Breaking City when mm. I you know because I used to play with them as you yeah. know and yeah. I love them to bits and great club, but looking at where they are now, it's they're just going to get into oblivion. Yeah, um, it's pretty sad. Uh, it just shows you how they, you know fall from grace from clubs. You know, Airdrie, it happened to them as well. I'm just naming a lot of my f- former clubs, folk. <laughs> you know, <it's>, yeah. <laughs> so I don't know if it's me. It's me. It's the jinx or not. <laughs> if if, if Clyde Bank's shown one thing, it's that you know, likes of breaking. It's not the end, or it doesn't have to be the end. You no, know, it can no. be just about regrouping, about playing at the level that suits you, and then building up on that. Yeah. Yeah. It's about having, having those people round about you that, that are willing to do this sort of hard graft. And luckily, Clay Bank did. Clay yeah. Bank had, had the people that were that were willing to sort of dig out the weeds at Glenhead Park and all that and get a get a pitch. That's right, yeah. And get, get a pitch that's suitable. Ah, and get a team ground. on it kind of thing. I think that's that's the thing is you need that wee, even that wee small group of people that are just willing yeah. to sort of roll their sleeves up and get tore in and start again. Mm-hmm. And even now, it's like, I mean, one th- I've been so impressed by the, the passion and the commitment by, you know, people on the board, people around the club. It's been absolutely amazing for, you know, I've been close to some of it and it's been absolutely amazing and it's inspiring. Mm-hmm. It's inspiring. It just makes you want to mm-hmm. help out the club and do more and do more. And I think that just, it's, it's like a snowball effect with people. And you're talking about yeah. the, in a view, to, view from a terrace, the piece on it. And it, I think things like that just remind people that, Firstly, we're still there. Clyde Bank's still there, and it still it means a lot. And it also reflects what a lot of people feel about their clubs or felt about their clubs, mm-hmm. and they maybe mm-hmm. think, oh, "I might feel like that again." And I think that's a good mm-hmm. thing. I think that's a good thing. Yeah, but when I think back to the the John Hall days, you know, taking them to Dublin and all, it's like absolute madness. You know. Mm. I mean, you know, fortunately, I was away by that time, but um, I don't know what would have happened if I'd have stayed. I really didn't, because there was a bit in the paper the other day there, you know, EDA has demanded a free transfer from Clyde Bank. I did not ever demand a free transfer. And then somebody else, I think it was the late Paul Jane, God rest him, he's a great yeah. big lad, I loved him. He had said, uh, you know, he, he's speaking to Hamilton Ackies now. now. Why would I leave Clyde Bank to go to Hamilton Ackies? I never, ever spoke to Hamilton Ackies in my life. Mm. I think I maybe spoke to Ian Munro at one time. I think Ian was a the manager there at one time. And, and he, all, I, knew, I knew he liked me and he wanted me there, but I never actually officially spoke to Hamilton about a move there. You know, why would I move from Clyde Bank to Hamilton? <laughs> I, when, my, when my testimonial was finished, I always said, and I said it to my family, right, I've had a good innings, I'm 36 now. I've went out in a high, you know, I've had a full house, at, or just about a full house at Clyde Bank against Rangers, blah, blah, blah. End of story. Went back to my office at Huden's and I said, I'm retiring, that's it. And then for some unknown reason, probably Sean Sweeney, I got the phone call from George Pete. Oh, Alec McDonald wants to talk to you. Are you interested? I said, no, I'm not interested in Come on, come on. There's another year in you. And they wanted to get to the playoffs. I don't know if I told you a story before. I, I don't, it's, it's a wee bit long. Well, I'll, I'll try and cut it short. 
So anyway, I met Alex. I went with Doddy down in Motherwell. He's got his training gear on. Went to an Italian restaurant. Had a bite of pasta. He said, uh, right, come on. I want you. We're trying to get up this year back to the Premier League. Uh, your goals will get us there. I'm like, right, well, what's the deal? Right? I wasn't that interested, but I said, what's the deal? Oh, I don't talk money. George Pete will phone you tomorrow. So gets the phone back in my office, gets the phone call, George Pete. Ken, George Pete here. Hi, George, how you doing? I, I believe you've agreed to come for a year. And I'm like, all right, okay. All right, what's the deal? How much you wanting? <laughs> you never ask anybody that. <laughs> <laughs> right? So I named a figure. And he was, ooh, because Sweeney had given me the tip, the, he tipped me the wink, because yeah. they just sold Broomfield, they had loads of money, you know, Sweeney had got money, Harvard got money, <laughs> you know, I was like, right, okay. So I named a figure, I'm not going to tell you what the figure was, I named a figure and he went, oh, you're hard to deal with, and I said, and you're paying the tax, because I'm not paying the tax on it. <gasps> Hummed and hawed, right, okay, so that was that. Signed for a year, played about, I don't know, from the start, maybe 12 games, sitting on the bench a lot of the time, because they were full-time. Alec had just said to me, keep yourself fit. I trained with Livingston a few times with Big Leishman when he was there, kept myself fit, and then come along on a Saturday, maybe on the bench, maybe start me. And I think I scored about 11 goals. And uh, so we come to, we get to the playoff. We get to the playoffs. Two-legged playoff against Hibs. So the first leg's at Easter Road. This is to get to the Premier League. Mm. So, we Doddy comes in and names the 14. I'm not even in the 14. I'm like, what have I done? So the boys are like, why, why, why are you? Anyway, forget it. He was up in the stand, watched it. Got beat one nothing. So the second leg was on the Tuesday night at Broadwood. So we're sitting in the dressing room. I'm, they're all going like, I said, need a goal, big man. You, you'll be in the night. You'll be in the night. So sitting there, still not in the 14. I'm raging. Absolutely raging. So we, Alex, says to me, come here. I need to talk to you. Who's doing to the office? He says, Kenny, I can't play you. I'm like, why? Because uh, somebody <clears throat> effed up your registration. I was like, what do you mean? He said, Josh Pete signed you for a year, but it didn't include the playoffs. <laughs> there you go. And he was one of the main men in the SFA. Yeah. So I couldn't play. So we went out and I think we went 2-1 up. Uh, Stevie Cooper scored, and then we got a penalty, I think. And then I think, who's the manager? Was it, was it Duff was the manager of Hibs at the time? He brought Darren Jackson on. Darren scored a hat-trick, and that was us, gone. Out. So I, I couldn't play. And I'd, actually, I don't even think I told the boys. I, I told the lads I was sitting up in the standby, yeah. you know, the guys that didn't get picked. And I was so mad because... He wanted me to get them to the, hopefully try and help them to get to the playoffs. But we reached the playoffs and I couldn't play in any of the games. That just, <laughs> oh, unbelievable. So, so then I left. My contract was up. Retire again. Guess the phone call Brown Alexander from Queen of the South. Hey, come on. You've got another two years in you and then the rest is there. Stayed there for two years. Yeah. <laughs> and then I got booed with the Clay Bang supporters. I remember that when we played against them. <laughs> I was like, really? <laughs> Tom, were you amongst those? I wouldn't even us. I wouldn't even mean that. No, no, I'd, probably you. <laughs> I'd, 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 have been, I'd have been sorting them out. There's no doubt about that. <laughs> so that's the every story, anyway. <laughs> so what, what about your, your time at Queen of the South? How, how did you find that? Was it, was it enjoyable? Were you... I, it was it was fantastic. It was fantastic because I went down there and Rowan, I'd, I'd known Rowan throughout the years, great striker, a bit like myself, good in the air, always scored goals, went down and him and Mark Shanks, he was his assistant, went down and it was all looked so professional when they were doing the training sessions. Not Nothing that I had, no disrespect to the other clubs I was with, but everything was sort of set up. You know, technology was starting to come in. We, we, had, we had actually... Uh, cardboard, cardboard cutouts for free kicks to try and bend them <laughs> round. Never had anything like that, you know, and everything was like geared towards training. Great, great gear for training. Yeah. You know, other clubs you used to go in and just grab what you could, you know. But this was uh this was like a step up. And Rowan says, uh, yeah, you know, your goals will get us hopefully up there and get promoted or whatever it was. And we started off okay. Um 
scored a few goals. Flanny was there uh, with me and uh, Stevie Marlin, and we got to the we got to the um, what do they call that cup? Challenge Cup Challenge. final against Falkirk. At, at final was at Fir Park. Unfortunately, we lost. I had a horrible, horrible groin injury two weeks before it. No, it was sorry, it was a hamstring. And uh, Ryan was like, "Come on, need you, we need you." And I was like, struggling. So you know what hamstrings like? If any's have had it, it's 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 a six eight week healer thing. And uh, I, I I got a steroid taken before the game, and I went out, and he had to sub me after, like a minute minute into the second half because I, I couldn't run. Mm. And I put Flanny on, and unfortunately we got beat one 0 But my heart and hearts, I should have said, put Flanny on for the beginning. Yeah. and just put me in the bench but that was my biggest regret for the Queen of the South fans I wasn't fit enough mm-hmm. but it was good first year it was okay uh, done okay and then we had a horrible start to the next year and uh, Rowan got fired so the chairman was a a great wee lad called Norman Blunt and uh, loved up my bits and he came to me and George Rowe and Obviously, George had played with me at Clay Bank. It's, it's two of the more senior players. And he said, uh, I want you to look after the, the players for the next match. So I always remember it. It was, a, it was an away game on a Sunday at East Fife. Uh, I don't know why he was playing on a Sunday, but we went to East Fife and we hadn't won in about nine games. We were sitting second bottom of the league. And uh, there was 13 games to go. And we won one nil at East Fife. I was like, oh. So uh, so Norman said, right, just keep doing what you're doing. So we played the last 13 games. We won 11, drew one, and lost one. And we ended up fourth. So Norman gave me and George the job for the next year. Yeah. But it's just the way things are. We, um, we must have been doing things right because we brought players in that weren't even in the first division, uh, first, the first team. Like Jimmy McAllister was in the reserves. Um, David Lilly was in the reserves. Brought them in. Put David Lilly right back. Jimmy at left back. And then I bought half for Wraith Rovers. Paul Harvey. Mm. Paid him. He was on good wages. But he wasn't getting a game at Wraith. So I said, he's the man to, to light us up. So we, we had Harv. And then we had big Derek Townsley. And we lost the four of them. Mm. Aberdeen paid 100 grand for each of Lilly and Jamie. Uh, mother will stole Harv. Remember Bill, Billy Davis phoning me at the office. I want Harv. I want Harv. I'll give you twenty grand. I said, "Be excited. I want three times as much as that." The wages I've paid them. Anyway, we've got more than that. And then Big David, uh, Big Townsley got snapped up with hips. We raked in over three hundred grand for Queen of the South, yeah. but we lost half a team. And then we started to struggle, and then we narrowly uh, avoided relegation because of Hamilton's stupidity. They turned up, didn't take part in the game and got docked something like 12 points that season. I don't know if you remember that. No, I don't. Uh, Hamilton got docked about 12 points and we scraped it by a point. And that's where it finished because Norman Blunt decided to retire at the end of that season because obviously we've, you know, we've managed to stave off relegation, but they changed the chairman, another little lad. And, uh, I didn't go on with him. I didn't like him. Yeah. And and that's basically he said, we've had enough. They brought John Connolly in as manager. Right. Uh, you know, ex St. Johnson, yeah, Scotland. Yeah. Uh, they brought him in as manager. And, and I, I officially retired for the third time. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I think George, <clears throat> George Rowe went to a broth after that. Yeah. He signed me a broth. So, um, so that, that was, you know, I didn't expect these last three years, but I still played till I was 40. Mm. And, that was a good milestone, you know. When when you when you did finish, did you was it did you think oh, my time's done, football's over, or did you miss it? Oh, I definitely miss it, and I still yeah. miss it. Yeah. Um I uh I was never a, I was never a, a favourite of um the coaching methods. Hmm. Never a favourite of the largs thing. I think it's not it's not uh, improved our game. Uh, they say it's world class because there's so many great managers come out of it, but national team's not done great. So I was never a, a firm favourite. I, I believe that if you've had a, a strong career and you're well respected in the game and you've got your own your own thoughts on how you should play. I mean, f- for me, 
I'd play a four four a four three three every week with a winger or two wingers and a centre forward. But the coaching methods nowadays don't want you to do that. Mm. It's all about ball retention. It's all about obviously don't give it away, ball retention. You know, well, let's play one up top and we'll play four across the middle and four at the back or whatever, five at the back. It's just so negative. I see it too much in games. It's all negative. Keep the ball, keep the ball, keep the ball. What are you going to do? You don't put the ball in the box. You don't score goals. And a lot of people have said that to me. You know, you know, we think the same. And this is why there's so many young coaches coming into the game now. They're getting taught the same thing. I think, just my opinion, because all the people that are handing it down are the people who've coached, you know, I could name names, I'm not. Um, they're, they're learning the same things they have learned for the past 30 or 40 years, and it's not changed, and we've not got any better. Just my opinion. I don't know how you think about it, but, you know, I'd, I'd play with wingers every week. I'd yeah. play with a big centre forward. I'd get the ball forward. You know, hopefully have something at the back. <laughs> but I would be so positive and yeah. go. And and we did that. We did that at Queen of the South and we were so positive and it paid dividends. Hmm. It, it, it does seem as though there's trends in football and right now the trends to play with one man up front and things like that. And it's like, you know, who, who decided that's the right way? And Andy, that's why I left Falkirk. Because when I signed for Falkirk, Billy Lamont was the manager. He was okay. Billy was a goalkeeper. And Billy set his stall out. Goalkeeper, five at the back, right? Four in the middle of the park and me up top. And I was playing against international defenders every week. Butchers, Roberts, uh, who were the Celtic two at the time? Derek White, Mick McCarthy, Willie Miller, Alec McLeish, uh, David Neary, Paul Hegarty. I'm there up myself, right? And this is why I get so fed up at Falkirk. Yeah. Because we were so negative. Because we were only part time, and that was another thing. Yeah. All these teams are full time, and we never had time to work on things. So, when I go and see, when I ever watch matches and I see one striker playing up front, I'm like, God sake, I, 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 I feel so sorry for the guy. You know, and yeah. unless he's Mbappe and he can do a hundred meters in like eight seconds. <laughs> yeah. So, just my thoughts, but. I think it's so negative a lot of the football. Can't disagree with that. What about you, Tom? I know. I agree. I agree with you, uh, Ken. The, the one thing we had at Clay Bank was always attacking football. Always, I mean, mm -hmm. like when me and Andy first started going, it was like Jerry McCabe, who was, uh, you know, Brilliant. terrorizing Class. defenses down the wing. So that's the kind of football oh. I've been brought up on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then uh, later on, you had Charlie. You had. Nice. You know, you had Harv, you had Oni, Tommy Brace, obviously myself. Yeah, it was but, always an attacking team, Clay. But always and an as, attacking as, team. As, as, as we know, like that Aberdeen Cup tie is just an example, you know, getting beaten 4-3. Mm -hmm. That's how we set our, our stall out, you know. Uh, yeah. yeah. So uh, that, was, that was what I always, always enjoyed. And I think that the Claybine team through the years have kind of kept that, have kind of kept that up, even in the sort of junior mm -hmm. leagues. Kind of thing. Mm -hmm. There's no mm -hmm. negative. They've always obviously Budgie McGee's manager for a long time. Yeah, he was, was clearly well. for a long time as well. So, uh, aye, yeah, mm -hmm. always a kind of thing. Overlapping fullbacks and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, Joyce, we had great Joyce. fullback John Mayer, Mark Trainer, Jim Rogers. I mean, mm. pace. And then later on, obviously with Gary Teal, Gary Bowman, just the guys that you want to go and pay money to watch. Yeah, you know, they'll go down the line, take out, take a defender on, whip the ball into the box. It gets people off their seats. You know, yeah, yeah, and again, again, just just as you mentioned that it's um that game against Hamilton Ackies at a call where we're getting beat two nothing, and uh, <laughs> you come on as a sub. Is that right? Was you and David? Well, it David was seemingly the it was seemingly the oldest bench in Scottish <laughs> football history. It was myself, Bomber Harris, and David Cooper on the bench. I think it was about a hundred and nine between us. <laughs> I, hey, I recall that. I was talking to somebody recently, but I recall that um, I'd been out for about eight months with a torn stomach muscle, and it was horrible. I could never, I couldn't get rid of it. Went to Lillis Hall, couldn't treat me, and it was so frustrating. And um, so Thursday night we were at training, and Brian said, "How are you feeling?" I said, "Oh, I'm feeling a lot better." I'll put you in the bed. No, I'll, I'll maybe start you on Saturday. 
I'm like, oh, right, it was Hamilton at home. So I'm like, okay. So I remember getting ready. I was living in Edinburgh, getting ready to go in my car. And uh, my car broke down. When I was leaving South Queen's Ferry at the time. I was like, oh, my God. First game by. <laughs> so I phoned my mate, my next door neighbour. I said, Ian, I've got a problem. I've, I've broken down. You want to come and watch Clyde back the day? And he said, oh. and he was a bit hungover. He's like, all right, I'll come and get you. Where are you? So he, he gets me caught. And then we got caught in traffic on the M8. Gets down the road, gets into coming along to Clyde Bank. I'm still more traffic, and I'm like, I'm I'm phoning in. I'll, I'll be there in five minutes. Stay in five minutes. I got there at twenty to three, but by that time Brian's got to put the team lines in. Aye. Right, I think they got to be in for half two or whatever it was, and uh, he, I get in. And he says, oh, f- "I've got you on the bench." I'm like, "Oh fuck!" So I was a wee bit mad. I'm like, right, okay. And uh, I think big Stevie Kerrigan started up front. And uh, we we're two 0 down. Yeah. <laughs> and Brian said, uh, "I don't know if it was half time or just after half time." He said, "Right, get ready." And I'm like, oh, "Am I going on?" He said, "Ah, you're going on." <laughs> and the rest was history. I scored a hat trick. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I remember Big Martin McIntosh. She was playing against me. He was a Hamilton at the time who used to play for us. And uh, he says, "Oh, cheers for that. You did. You just spoiled my birthday. It was his birthday." <laughs> 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 and I remember giving when I came out. Uh, called Bowie I, I handed the match ball to my mate next door neighbour I said yeah that's for you he still got it nowadays <laughs> so, so I, that was that, that was my comeback yeah uh, it was one of my favourite games I played, just, just as I sort of ran in the mill ran in the mill league match and I remember just yourself and, and Davy Cooper just yeah. kind of uh, running, running the show kind of, kind of thing even though we were 2-0 down and we'll come by and win it 3-2 me Coop and Bomber eh? what, a, what a bench that was <laughs> Because yeah. right, I'd have been about, what, 35? Coop was about 38. And Bomber was I were just over 100, I think. 104, <laughs> 105 between us. <laughs> Good times. Okay, so just popping back in the magazine here. And the next one I'm going to look at, we, we spoke about it when we were talking about Frank Worthington. So there's this football medallion offer. <laughs> so I'll just have a, a quick... So here we go. It says, buy one or collect the set. And it's a bronze medallion for all the English First Division clubs. It's one and a half inches in diameter with the name and badge on the front and illustrations of cups won and honours on the back. So it's £1.99 for each medallion. And it's £1 extra if you want a detachable chain with it as well. Wow. And you can buy the full set in a presentation case for £38.75. But that's a £5 saving if you bought all the medals individually. The advert is illustrated with a smiling polo neck gentleman wearing the medallion, and it gives you a good si- good idea of the size of that thing. Uh, it's not small and unobtrusive, is it? Um, you can also purchase a medallion in solid silver in a presentation box for just, and I'm highlighting the word just here, £17.50. Um, just. Uh, were, were you ever, ever a medallion or a, a, a no. necklace or a chain man, Ken? I had a chain, yeah. I had a chain when I was at Breakin. Flem used to lie, used to call me a medallion man. <laughs> I to, but you know how everybody, or Charlie Nicholas started, I think. He had a big Aye. gold rope, right? Aye. But I couldn't afford to go when I had a silver one. It was <laughs> it was silver, it wasn't a, none of that Aye, yeah. cheap rubbish that rots your neck. But I had a silver one and I wore it everywhere. And Flem used to say, oh, there's medallion man coming again. You know, my boss seen Flem. And, uh, yeah, so I had one of them. Mm. Getting back to these collection things, uh, the first thing I ever collected was uh, they used to sell before your time, Andy. Um, oh, maybe you as well, Tom. They used to sell them in ESO garages, mm. the ESO coins of footballers. I think it was either teams or or players. I think I've done to... this before, but give me a minute. And he's got them. And he's got them somewhere. Has he got? Has he got a set? Has he? <laughs> uh, a few of the other guests that we've had on have, have said that that that's what they would. That's what they, they would do with their dad or whatever was filling up with petrol. They'd be getting that. I think it was a. Yeah, it was. I think it was a coin. It was either a. It was a football team. I think Tom, right. not individuals. I might be wrong. I don't know. But I, I remember collecting them, and then the other ones were later on was the panini stickers. I remember yeah, yeah. them. Yeah, I think I was in them with a moustache. <laughs> <laughs> and you might have that as well. Uh, yeah, you used to you used to push them in, Andy. Is that yes? Is, in, yeah. That's teams. Is it teams? Yeah. Wow. Wow. 
So still, one of them, one of them's just fallen out actually. It's a, so I'll show you that up. Where is it? Let me see. West Ham. Is it metal? Well, it's it's plastic. It certainly looks metal, but it's really thin right. and right. It's, it's yeah. probably along the same idea as the the panini stickers that you used to get. Yeah. Um, but and they're just they're just teams, aren't they? They're not players. They're teams. Yeah, just teams. There's also yeah. you can get. They used to do coins and stuff as well. Yeah, I remember the coins well, as well. I think they were World yeah. Cup ones. Um, you used wow. to get the England teams and things like that. But yeah, it's. Um, I mean, this this wasn't something that I would have collected at the time because, I mean, my family never had a car, so we wouldn't have went to a garage anyway. But this is something mm -hmm. I've picked up since. Um, but How much you know, is that worth? What just now? Um, what 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 you want to buy it for? <laughs> never, as you say, never ask. Never ask how no, much do you I want. I, I asked was well, somebody posted on. There's a guy on Facebook called Bone Jimmy. I think it is. Right. You know, Jimmy Bone. He used to yeah, play yeah. St Mum, and he posted on one of my heroes at St Mum was Dougie Sumner. Right, right. He's a centre forward. And he posted on this photograph of Dougie Somers St Mirren shirt, the number nine in the back. And I, I thought it was Jimmy Bone. Right. And I know Jimmy, and I post, Jimmy, what do you want for that? And he went, you need to make me an offer. And then I knew it wasn't Jimmy <laughs> Bone. I think he's just an alias. He's called <laughs> yeah. Bone Jimmy or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. I didn't make him an offer. He'd be wanting thousands for it, probably. <laughs> <laughs> so on, yeah. on this, the, the, the thing about this advert that sort of takes me a wee bit is, it's, they're not cheap, but it looks a sort of cheap advert. You know, they I could have at that. least um, pushed out and got a proper photograph. You never trust a drawing advert, do you? Anything that's drawn, no. I always think, it's right, what's dodgy. going on here? Aye. <laughs> it's never going to look like that. <laughs> okay, um, let's see what we got next. So moving on to pages 16 and 17. So this is <laughs> this is about goal scorers. So oh god, uh, it says, can anyone hit the thirty league goal target this season? So I know where this is going to end up, but let's have a wee read through <laughs> this. Um, Bob Latchford broke the thirty goal barrier last season to clinch a ten thousand pound prize, the first time since nineteen seventy one to seventy two a player in the top two divisions had done it. The Daily Express wow. started offering the ten thousand pound prize in season seventy five seventy six. And then in 75 76, it was Derek Hales of Charlton, went close with 28 with one game to go, but they got beat 4 0. 76 to 77, Mickey Walsh of Blackpool led with 26, and 70 70 78 is when Bob Latchford broke the barrier. Now, Shoot asks, who are the challengers this season? Latchford started on fire, scoring goals in the League Cup, but the league was slow, though he's now getting back into his best form. Frank Worthington at Bolton is also mentioned. Favourite must be Liverpool's Kenny Dalglish. One drop point out of 22 in the first 11 league games spells trouble for the other clubs. Dalglish is leading the way in the club scoring charts, but also Graham Souness is finding the net as well at the club. A short candidate is John Ryan, who netted 15 goals for Norwich last season, and Ted McDougall never fails to get a decent haul of goals, and Southampton would love to see him hit the target. It mentions uh, if and Andy Gray of Aston Villa can steer clear of injury, he too could be in the running. The biggest challenge for the prize could come from the second division, where Brian Pop Robson and David Cross of West Ham have both scored hat tricks already this season, and Peter Rando of Bristol Rovers was impressive last season. So, as a spoiler, the first division top scorer would be Frank Worthington at Bolton, and he scored 24 goals, and second division was Pop Robson or Brian Robson. West Ham United and 24 goals as well, so it wasn't actually won that season. But I mean, we just look at that fight 10,000 pounds back in 75 76, but that would easily buy you a house and more wow. back then. Yeah. It's, it's a lot, a lot of money, and it's it seems to be not just for the top division either, it could come from a lower division, which you would think. You know, you think ten thousand at the the top division, five thousand at the second division, or whatever that. But you know, they opened it right up, which you know, again, for me, that's like that's great. That's along the lines of just saying get rid of seeding and things like that. So like whoever scores thirty goals first wins it. So did you did you win the ten thousand pound Daily Express, or was it maybe <laughs> something a bit? It was might it might have been a tenth of that. <laughs> so what so what we talking was... season nineteen ninety one was it? Uh, May 
11th of May 1991, I think it was, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah. They think the 20 something anniversary is coming up soon. <laughs> I keep getting reminded. Um, I got a, I got a thousand quid and um, I got a uh, 12 bottles of Moe Chandon, <laughs> which I don't even like. I think I gave half it away, gave most of it away, mm. and, and I got the trophy for a year, obviously. But uh, no, I think it was the first time it had been won in five years. Yeah. Because nobody, I think it was four or five years, because nobody got to 30. Mm. And I, I, I remember, I always looked at the scoring charts all through my career. And I always, always wanted to be up there in the top two or three. And and it, it, going into the last game, me and Gordon DL from Wraith were both sitting on 26. And uh, I was like, okay, I'm, I'm not going to hit the 30, but just try and get, Scotland's top goal scorer, whatever, right? It'd be a nice wee claim to fame. So I think we went we went 1-0 up and then it was 1-1 at half time. And it was horrible. I hadn't kicked my backside. <laughs> and uh, I, did, I remember we were going out to uh, Magaluf hmm. right after the game. And um, and I think everybody's mind was on, it was yeah. on the holiday rather than the game because it was a nothing game apart from being a derby. Thistle always brought a good support, maybe about two and a half, three thousand at the game. And then it just stuck, okay. Was it John Dixon? John Dixon scored next. And we get too, and then, we get too rapid, eh? Too rapid. And then I scored, and then I scored again. And then all of a sudden I'm like, oh no, sorry, I forget. I'll go back to stage at half time, came in. And somebody, I don't know who it was, some twat said to me, oh, does he score two for Wraith? <laughs> and I, <laughs> yeah, I don't know who it was, but. I was like, all right, okay, doesn't matter, so goes out. And then I'll never forget this because I'd never scored a hat trick before mm-hmm. for Clyde Bank. And when I, I scored the three, I was like, wow, there's a milestone. What put me on 29? And uh, and this is a true story, right? Nobody will believe me. but And I still talk to him nowadays because I used to go every year to the Meadow Bank golf out. Big guy called Grant Tierney, mm-hmm. centre half of Partick. Played with Meadow Bank for many years. Grant was a part of Thistle centre half that day. And I remember when we got the corner, Gordon Mayer was taking it from the left side of the Bankies Club as you looked on. Right? I said to Big Tierney, kidding on, I said, leave me in the box and I'll give you a couple of hundred quid. And he was like, <laughs> what are you on about? I said, because if I score, I've won the daily record golden boot. And to this day, he always says to me, I left you in the box. I said, oh, you did. And I just remember the ball coming across. I think he did make it. There's a photograph of me and him. And I think you couldn't get a newspaper under him. And I was up like a salmon. Yeah. And I think I bulleted it right down the bottom corner. And I, it was as if there was about 20,000 at Kilbowie. As you say, they were all running over benches to get to. Yeah. It was a fantastic feeling. It really yeah. was. And then... We went away to Magaluf that night, sitting at the airport, and the the flight was delayed. So somebody phoned the Daily Record to say, "Oh, Kennedy's up at Glasgow Airport." So the cameras came up and presented me with the trophy, but they obviously took it away again, and they never gave me the grand. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and when we got there, it was a nice wee a nice wee gesture for me. A lot of the guys I played with at that time, um, they weren't earning much. They didn't have a good job. I had a good job and. So I, I promised them all on the last night in Magaluf, I'll pay for all the drink. So we sat in Mano's bar, I don't know if you've ever been there, and it was just crates of lager. It was vodka and we sat there, and I think it cost me about 500 quid. <laughs> so that was a wee gesture. Um, and then I believe that Thistle's trip got cancelled. Yeah, I can imagine. Lam- yeah. Lamby stopped it. Ah, he said, you're not going on holiday for that doing. So that ah, was a good... Uh, it was a good... Um, I've still got photos. I've got some more. I was in the garage recently, and I've got all photos. There's a couple of me and Gordon DL. I might stick one on Facebook. It's like somebody giving me the trophy, and me and Dad's been there. But it was a good memory, really mm. good memory. Oh, it, you know, I'm I'm sure Tom's probably saying, but for me, it was my greatest ever game of football that I've been to in terms of. Oh, was it everything? Yeah, yeah, it was. You know. As as the second half proceeded, and as you got a couple of goals, I've, I've never seen anything like it. Yeah. A game, the amount of chances that just it, wave it was, after wave, and, and it was just about everything. Mm-hmm. Was about get it to Ken, get it to Ken, mm-hmm. and then it was mm-hmm. a it was a force of will 
from everybody yeah. in the team and everybody in the stand, in the in the ground was just about getting you the goals, getting you the goals, and and it was it really yeah. was you could feel it at the time, you could sense yeah. it because it was it you was know, like nothing else because there came a point where the game was won, but it was mm-hmm. more about just getting you to score four. Get, right, I can't remember. I, I scored four, but I can only remember the last goal. I mm-hmm. can't remember any other goals. I, if I can remember them, they must have been good goals, but they, they weren't good goals. Because Andy Murdoch, I think he had a shocker, oh, didn't he? Did, uh, I, yeah. I was clapping in them were going in the back of the net. I, I mean, I don't know if you remember any of the first three. So I said to somebody recently that one of them was a penalty. It was, you know, David Lundberg. It, yeah, it, yeah, there's yeah. a lot. David said none of them were penalties. Yeah. So I, I can't even know. remember the other, can't remember <laughs> the other three. I remember the last one, the header. Yeah. That's all. Yeah. But there was other chances as well. You had other chances on top of mm-hmm. that. And it was just like chance after chance after chance. And wave you, after wave. Yeah. <laughs> and as you said, Thistle were, for, for me, Thistle were the team, our team to play against. They were our derby team. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and yeah. th- there was a lot of, um, there just seemed to be a little bit of bad Hatred. blood. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. Um, and I, I don't know personally where that came from, whether it was just because, you know, Thistle, I, I sort of think maybe Thistle sort of thought themselves above the division and things like that that they were in and I think mm-hmm. that maybe transferred they had a good over. team they had a good team then mm. you know yeah um, we'd, we'd beaten them 3-0 the game before was that the game before at Fur Hill I think the game after at Fur Hill we beat them we beat them 3-0 I'm right. sure yeah because I remember saying uh, 10 in two games I, yeah, I, I, I got a couple up there that, as well I think that night when we won I think uh, we all, did George Rono score that night as well it's, that, think, it's hard to tell what we used to, yeah. isn't it? Everybody else gets you mixed Ginger up programs <laughs> and f- football. I remember program. the Scottish semi-final program. Mm. They got it, did a big, huge, massive, big article on me yeah. and my profile and all that, and stuck a f- photo of Ginger George. In. Was there no two photos <laughs> of him? I think there might actually yeah. be two photos of him in that program. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. I, yeah, well. I, no, it was one of Harv and one of George, <laughs> and I wasn't even there. <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Excellent. Well, I love the idea of them um, ruining Partick Thistle's end of season holiday as well. So well done for that. I'm, I'm sure. I believe they're going to be printing new T-shirts. You know, there were the seven one on yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. I seen. Uh, I think Tom Coyle's going to be in charge of it. They're trying to. They're trying to resurrect it because everybody's looking. Has anybody got the original print? Blah blah blah. I've still got mine in my drawer through there. Yeah. <laughs> it was Tom that done the the original one. Was, was it, it Tom that did it? Was it? I think so. Yeah. Because ah, he was right. selling, cause I bought one. He was selling them a few years ago, uh, and right. a reprint. But uh, this is the, uh, the 30th anniversary coming up next month. Is yeah. it? A th- wow. Yeah. Gee, was <laughs> so uh, well, to, just get... just briefly just looking at the two teams then. So uh, Thistle's team was uh, Andy Murdoch, Graham Robertson, Paul McLaughlin, Jim Duffy, Gordon Ray, Grant Tierney, Sammy Johnson, Declan Roach, Colin McLashen, Bobby Law, and John Buckley. And the Bankies team, Billy Spence, John Trainer, Jim Roger, Brian Smith, Sean Sweeney, Brian Wright, Paul Harvey, Alan Lansdowne, Kenny Day, Henry Templeton, Gordon Mayer. Gordon Mayer. See, I, yeah. I think I think Gordon Mayer was instrumental that day and probably it was. And I, I never saw oh, the seven one against Morton as well, but I, I think he was as well. But when he was on fire, when he was oh, he, unplayable. He, he, mm, brilliant. Un, unplayable. I, I used to pick him up. I, I used to give him the lefty training. Gordon was a great lad. I, I, I don't know where he is. Is he still alive? The, the last, the, the last we heard, the, it's a bit of a, um He was working in a, a, a superstore or something like that. Was that right, Tom? Is he? Was that? Was that I don't know. Um, yeah, right. Yeah, the, the, because there's, I mean, there's a couple that you know I, I used to play with. I came across and I didn't realise, but they, they passed away. Hmm. You know, I know, you know, Tom Spence. Right. Played like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, Tom's gone. You know, and. It, 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 Brian that played at the back on that game. Hey, Brian Smith. Brian Smith's no longer with us. Okay. Is that right? I didn't tell you. I, I, I'm pretty sure I heard that. Uh, I might be wrong, but I know that I know one is Tom Spence. But uh, no, again back to Gordon. Gordon was uh, Gordon, as you say, when he was on fire, he was unplayable. Hmm. Unplayable. Yeah. yeah. And the, I've, yeah. I've always said that about him. It's like. You, you know, it's it's wingers, isn't it? You know early on if they're up for it or not. If if the, mm-hmm. the first time they mm-hmm. go past somebody, generally, if it works, then you think, okay, it's it's a confidence thing with, with them, isn't it? I I couldn't remember Duff playing that game. 
Jim Duffy was playing. God, I yeah. used to have a hard time against Duff, but he'd obviously <laughs> done, he'd done off day that day. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That that result obviously overshadowed another big game that was taking place in Glasgow that day as well. If you remember that game, Rangers beat Aberdeen two 0 to clinch the league in the last game of the season. Aye. And I went home thinking I that we would see highlights of the Clyde Bank game. What was I thinking? <laughs> There's absolutely no video footage of that game anywhere, Andy. I don't think. Oh, but, but I love to... Somebody, somebody had it, but they only had the first half. That was why. Oh, really? <laughs> Maybe they gave up half. and went, "Oh, I am going home." Yeah. The, the, this is the holy <laughs> grail. This is the holy grail. What a this, shame. This, this rumours um... because I, I've, I've got, I've got all the footage of the St. Man three two game, the every two 0 game, even my testimonial. I've got, I got it done professionally. The testimony it cost me a lot of money to get it done, but unfortunately, I, I've I've had a word uh, with is it Colin Cameron? Yeah, yeah. I had a word with Colin before I came over here. Uh, I got it uh, transferred from VHS <laughs> onto a DVD, and I got a nice box made up. It was a local guy who was doing them, and he was charging me. Well, for one, I think he charged me about a tenner to flip it over onto uh, CD. And I, I remember speaking to, just putting it out there to Tom, Tom Coyle and Colin Cameron. Do you think anybody would be interested in these? It's I would love someone. There is no commentary on it. Yeah. All you hear is the crowd, crowd noise. There's no commentary on it. I'd love somebody to be able to grab that and take it and put commentary into it. And then it would probably be more uh, appealing to yeah, people. Yeah. And I did mention the fact that if I can get it, if we got it done cheaply enough and near a Christmas, I don't know if any of you can get somebody to take it up and I could send you it, whatever. But just to get it done as a, be a nice wee Christmas present for somebody. Hmm. Yeah. You know, if it was if it was priced enough and what I would do, I would donate some of it towards the club as well. Yeah. I mentioned that, but yeah. nobody's ever came back to me. So I've got the original there. And it's the last ever game at Claybank. Hmm. I, th- I think um, we, we, we could we could run with that, Tommy. I think. Yeah, no, yeah, see, absolutely. See, see what you can come up with because I've still got it there, and I would trust you if I give you it. Then hmm. we could maybe get something done straight, straight on so, the internet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> YouTube, uh, no YouTube. What's it called? What's yeah. that thing? That's you, YouTube, eh? yeah. eBay. Oh, eBay. eBay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I think. Yeah, let's run with it. Let's see. If yeah, we can, we can do. I mean, as well, I say, well, there might there might not be a lot of interest, but there might be enough to get a few enough. quid for a club or something like that. that you know? I, I, there absolutely would be enough. I mean, Paul Cumming does, did the commentary on uh, the live streamed games. Hmm. So, oh, did he? Aye, good, and yeah. he was Great. he was he ah. was really good. And uh, I know I, th- I think I think they could uh, they could they would look look to do that do a sort of ret- retro commentary. No, you, you get that no. sometimes in ESP ESPN. You'll see games mm-hmm. from the seventies or something, and it's obviously a modern day. Commentary they're, 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 of it. Yeah, they're, they're doing yeah. so. Aye, well, that and, and be... uh, just just um, another option is you could firstly you could maybe get ten minute clips and get different commentators. You know, try and get Archie McPherson to do ten minutes and things uh-huh. like that. Or you could do sort of a director's cut, so you can get mm-hmm. yourself and some of the players from the who have played and just sort of talk mm-hmm. through the game and do that as well mm-hmm. as a sort of director. Oh, you're right. I'm with you. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. I could definitely do something. Because yeah. a few comedy clips in that we could put in anyway. Because I remember Koisty, he got through that night, and I remember when I had been, I couldn't hit a barn door with a shovel. I was missing everything. Then uh, after he, I think it was after he scored the second one, back to take centre, and he said, "Hey, big man, your boots are on the ring feet tonight, are they?" <laughs> and then Gary Bowman slung a cross and then I hit her in the top corner, and I went back to the centre, and I went. I don't need boots on my head, guys. <laughs> <laughs> it's great fun. Yeah. <laughs> but that was a good game. I enjoyed it because it was very competitive because they needed the work. They, they were playing the Scottish Golf Final the following week and they'd, that was a free weekend for them, so they had to get some work in. And yeah. all these guys were playing for a place in the final. Yeah. Right. But what a turnout. What a start in the living they had. Gee whiz. Loudrops, Gascoigne's Golf, Gorham, Stuart McCall. Uh, could go on and on. Mm-hmm. Gordon uh, Jury. It's just like I'm just, the, I'm just pulling the team sheet up here. Uh, Alan Cleland, I think, played as well. Yeah. John Brun. So, uh, so the Rangers team is Andy Gorham, Trevor Stephen, Alex Cleland, yeah. Richard Goff, Alan McLaren, John Brown, Gordon Jury, Paul Gascoigne, 
Ali McCoy, Stuart McCall, Brian Louder, Ian Durant, and Lee, Ro- uh, uh, Lee Robertson. That's the subs. <laughs> Yeah, Barry Ferguson and Gordon Petrick were on the benches. Right? Gordon Petrick, I mean, that, yeah. That's not far off a full strength team. Ah, yes, a, a proper I know. full team. Yeah. Gascoigne, Lewis, yeah. McCoy's. It, yeah. was, it was good timing by Jack, Jack Steedman, because <laughs> he did say that he would sort a testimonial out, and that was my, my last year of my, my third third contract. And I always said, he said, who well, you want it against? I always said, well, put not mind the Rangers. And, and what timing that was, you know, Rangers to get the final of the Scottish Cup, yeah. you know, have no game the week before it, yeah. and then what he to bring his full strength team there, and uh, to be the last game ever at Clyde Bank, it was just stuff dreams are made of. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Just, you so see what you can do about the DVD and let me know, and Absolutely. I'll, 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 I'll work with you. Yeah. Good. Just when you mentioned them there, uh, Ken, Jack Steedman, how did you how did you get on with, with Jack? Yeah, years I was away. like he's uh, he was like my second dad to be fair I was there that long uh, and funny enough believe it or not Andrew Steedman's over here and Ian's over here right and they've invited me up to their uh, coaching schools right. in North Carolina okay. in the summer and he said I'll put you to work if you want so it's like so I said right give me your old man is your old man still alive yeah of course he is oh yeah he's still got his marbles and all that. so give me his phone number I phoned him last week, right? right? And I kidded on his own call. Hi, is that Mr. <laughs> Steedman? Right? He went, yeah. I said, uh, how's it going? Who's that? And he, he sounded the exact same. And I said, it's, it's only coil here. It's not only coil, he said. I said, who do you think it is? And he hummed and hawed and hummed and hawed. And he went, are you serious? And he said, Mr. Eddie. And I went, really? So we had a, I, I couldn't get him off the phone. Yeah. I couldn't get him off the phone. Uh, we were just reminiscing about everything, about all the great games, and and he would reminisce about when he played, how good he was, you know. And Andrew would warn me, he said, if you get my dad on the phone, you'll never get him off. So we had a fantastic conversation and basically just bummed each other up <laughs> <laughs> for about an hour and a half. Yeah. Uh, he's living, he's 95, 96 wow. now. Still... Uh, Nah, he's, he says, I've still got all my marbles and that. He says, I might not be as fit as I was, but I'm still doing okay. And then it was him that said, get your ass over to America and go and see these boys and, and put some of these young kids through their paces. So I maybe pop it. It's not that far from me. It's maybe a five hour, six hour drive or something like that. So I, I might pop up and maybe take the family up there for a week and just do some some running about and coaching with the kids. I believe that some of the old Clay Bank guys come over. Yeah, Big, I think Gal Jim comes over. Does, yeah. Big Jim comes over, doesn't he? Yeah. So I might, might even catch up with one or two of them. So I know Jack, I get on fantastic. It, not, it's not everybody's cup of tea mm-hmm. with what happened with the club. And I can totally appreciate from the from the fans' point of view. I, I, I really don't know why they're still not in existence at Kilbury. I Well, I do and I don't. The, about the old planning permission for the other ground up in the boulevard, yeah. whether that was whether it was true or whether it was just a to sidestep everyone. But uh, but at the end of the day, business is business. They might have decided as a family just to say, right, okay. I think the Bosman thing, we spoke yeah. about that. The Bosman thing killed clubs like Clyde Bank because that's where the bread and butter came from in transfers. I remember Breakin getting 50 grand for me when they sold me to Falk. I kept them going for a couple of years, two or three years, without having to do anything. So we spoke about that at length, and and I think Jack had admitted that the Bosman thing, it snookered Clay Bank. Mm. But I think from a supporter's, I totally agree from a supporter's point of view, it, they've, they've put them down as, and the whole family down as as rogues, but I, I don't know. I tend to disagree because... I had so many happy memories with them. They never done me any wrong. I did a lot of good for them as a club. I, I would have still been there, but I just wanted to, I wanted to retire, really. I wanted to retire. Um, but I've got so much respect for them. I, I spoke to somebody else about it, but they're talking recently about coaching or signing players. And someone said to me, oh, it, was, it was Mark Shanks, that used to be assistant manager at Queen of South. Uh, put a post on recently and I said that's why the Steedmans were so good at unearthing talent and spotting talent and signing talent 
is because they were prepared to go and stand in a wet, cold, windy Sunday morning, Saturday morning, and look at talent. Whereas Mark had said to me, it's all about the laptop brigade now. Mm. They don't even see players before they sign them. And then Paul Flex, and he came, remember Big Flex that played with Clyde? Yeah, kind of said, yeah. Well, Paul came on to me and he said, I totally agree. He said, Craig Brown came to a Red Blaze Park in Easter House in Glasgow, came and watched me under 15 football at schools and, uh, and signed me because he was prepared to go and stand and watch games. The statements done it all the time. Mm-hmm. And even when talent went down south, uh, if, if bigger English clubs came in and picked talent up and these players didn't actually make it down south, the Steedmans were first to snap them up when they came back up the road mm-hmm. because they knew they were good enough. Paul yeah. Harvey is an example. Yeah. Went to Man United, threw the whistle at Fergie, Phew, get back up the road, you're signing with us. Yeah. <laughs> and this is, that's it. People are just, I, I don't I don't even think people go and watch matches now they're watching a player. They do it on video. Mm-hmm. Oh, let's have a look at him. Oh, he looks okay. What did they do for the other 65 minutes? You know what I mean? <laughs> like, yeah. So, but sorry, sorry, digress. Getting back to Jack. Full respect for him. And I think he'd the same for me. Never had any run ins, apart from when I get sent off in the quarterfinals in Scottish <laughs> against Stirling Albion for he'd button a guy. But um, <laughs> that was uh, that was the only follow I ever had with him. <laughs> yeah, glad to see he's still alive and he's still got his marbles. And, and no doubt I'll talk to him again soon. Good health to him, good health to him. And so we've come to the end of part one of our podcast with Kennedy. We hope you've enjoyed it and we'll come back next time to listen to the second half. In the meantime, here's a word about our charity partner. Our charity partner this season is the Western Bartonshire Community Food Share. This is a charitable organisation that provides various services and support to the local community, including the following. A school uniform bank, school holiday brunch bags, food provisions, Christmas toy bank, cooking and growing lessons and a baby bank. They provide essential support to the local community in supporting individuals and families and we will be looking to support them in any way we can through the podcast. This will include drives for donations of food, money and support in the form of volunteers. We will also be raising awareness of the group to highlight the work that they do but also to ensure that families and individuals who can benefit from the group are aware of these vital services. You can follow them on the West Dunbartonshire Community Food Share Group on Facebook or West Dunbartonshire Community Food Share.co.uk for the website. And that's West Dunbartonshire with an N. You can also donate through our Just Giving page for the charity at justgiving.com forward slash fundraising forward slash shoot the breeze one word. Also keep an eye on our Twitter accounts at shoot tb underscore podcast and at Scott's Footy Cards for updates and news on our charity partner. We'd like to say a special thank you to Pete Wiley of the Mighty Wah for the use of the story of the blues in the music for our show. You can catch up with Pete on petewiley.co.uk where you can check out the details of upcoming gigs and new music. We'd also like to thank our producer Diane Jarden for her great work and support on the podcast. Please check out transmissionroom.co.uk where you can book music recording and rehearsal facilities in Clybank. Thank you again to our guest Kennedy, and for Tom, as always, being Tom. And thanks to you for listening. Please share the podcast among your friends, subscribe to the show, and check out our YouTube channel. Until the next time, let's shoot the breeze. <laughs>